Hey, hey it's, it's your buddy, buddy David Wilcock. Wilcock. How are you? Whew, man, man there's been, been a lot going on. on. Um, this, this whole prophecy thing, thing that's happened to me has been utterly mind-blowing. And I actually had kind of a tearful episode yesterday. yesterday. It wasn't kind of, it was. Uh, the, the scope of what has happened in these psychic readings that I brought through in 1999, uh, starting last week, we began reading October 1st, 1999, taking it from there, the, the enormity of this prophecy is, is very, very astonishing. Uh, when I did think about this some more, I realized that there is a precedent for this uh, in terms of the history of prophecy, but there's only one example I could actually think of. If you look at the Great Seal of the United States, which is the uh, seal that's on the obverse side, of where the eagle is, the other side of the U.S. eagle on the Great Seal, which is on every dollar bill, is the pyramid with the all-seeing eye on the top. And then on the bottom, it says Novus Ordo Seclorum. Everybody has this on the dollar bill, right? What you may not realize is that according to uh, Civil War hero, who I've shared many times before, he wrote a letter to the Secretary of the Treasury in the late 1800s, and the conclusion... Is there a problem? There's an echo. Yeah, I don't hear it through this way. Okay. Um, hmm. Then, then I, I think, think I know what we got to do. Let's try. Let's just see what happens, what happens if we turn this off. off. Now, can they still hear me or not? Oops. That. <laughs> that back in there. <laughs> put, put that, that on there, there but, but then, then if, if people, people are, saying are saying there's an echo, echo we're, we're going to turn this one off, off to see if that'll work for us. Okay, okay. now do I still, is the echo gone everybody? Does that still sound like an echo? Yes? yes? Okay, great. See, I just got to stay relaxed and not get freaked out. That's all that's necessary. Um, well, that's something good to know. I didn't realize that uh, I didn't have to create a separate audio track, actually. I thought I did. Anyway, when we get back to the obverse sign of the... Actually, let's, let's start from the beginning so we can recut this if I had a horrible echo the whole time. All right, so we'll go back to... Hey there, it's David Wilcock. Uh, we're starting this again because we had an echo problem. Uh, welcome. This is going to be a very, very amazing show this week. Uh, we just got our audio fixed. Thank you for bearing with us. And uh, my newfound calm in handling live stream problems. You know, I actually didn't get mad. So, <laughs> just kind of amazing. You, you work so hard on this stuff. I mean, honestly, this, this type of thing, and actually there's one more thing I can do. It's going to fix the echo, as I just realized. I have a hole. Huh? Well, that's not going to work. Just hang this up. <laughs> well, if, I don't know. Let's just... Uh... There's always fun problems, folks. That's the nature of live streaming. Okay. Yeah, if you want to try to see if you can, somebody who's tall can get up there and try to stick those back in. But it's holding, it's holding. Okay. All right, that's the other thing I needed as a barrier to uh, prevent my voice from reverberating and echoing. So now we should have a really good thing. Um, we actually hung up some acoustic ceiling foam so now there should be a lot less reverb than before. All right, so back over here again. Um, apart from all the other things that are going on in my life, which is very amazing, working on this company that can, you know, we're, we're literally working on anti-gravity and free energy. And then to find out that this was prof prophetic that I had uh, a dream back in December 1999 where I was one of the fathers of anti-gravity. Looking for that dream while thinking about it in light of what I'm doing now, that, that whole situation is what led to 
me finding this time loop in the first place. So I followed the basic principles of remote viewing, which remember, I was a big Art Bell fan. This was, uh, I discovered uh, the internet. I got online in, in like no November 1995, and I found the Art Bell show right away. He was the main UFO uh, show on the radio. And Art Bell, his big thing was remote viewing. He was always obsessed with it. He was always talking about it. So it only seemed logical as a fan of Art Bell to actually delve into remote viewing and try to accomplish this myself. And then we have Dr. Courtney Brown, as I talk about in my new book, Awakening in the Dream. That's the book where all this stuff is discussed. If you need the backstory, if you'd like the backstory, go get that book, because it's very amazing what's going on. Uh, this time loop is, is stunning. Anyway, as I said last week, uh, I, was, I was doing this work, and in 1996, after being online, reading about remote viewing, Art Bell was always talking about it, I decided to practice it, and I modified the protocols for human speech, so I was listening while in this very deep trance state. As the material came through, uh, what I discovered was that it was extremely prophetic. So I'd have a stack of tapes on my desk that might be a month old where I dictated this. And then as at the moment that I would start transcribing the cassettes, they would be describing what just happened to me. It's mind blowing to have this happen. It's mind blowing to be listening to whatever you can hear in the morning, because if you do listen, you will hear speech. It is, it will be there and you want it to not sound like anything that you understand. So you're looking for cryptic data. Well, when they started predicting the future, it really caught my attention. And very quickly, I began to get coaching from these higher forces, whatever they were, telling me that I was too worried, I was too nervous, I had too much stress in my life, and my diet was horrible. The biggest two things they really stressed was no wheat and no sugar. Uh, and it also turns out, by the way, that if you go to any of these clinics, that promise weight loss through hypnosis, always their big secret gimmick is just convincing you not to eat wheat and sugar and using hypnosis to reinforce the point. Because if you just do those two things, you will lose a significant amount of weight. Uh, that is true. So this was one of the things that they were telling me about back in the day. They needed me to be a, a, a cleaner instrument. Um, sugar apparently greatly diminishes your psychic abilities. And they were very worried about this. And as I said last week, two other published authors who were psychics, Gordon Michael Scallion and Whitley Strieber, both also said that their ETs didn't want them to eat sugar either. So this is a kind of a common thing. And it's again, a big, big thing to let go of. So, you know, I'm 48 years old and I think part of why I still look this young, in fact, probably the main reason is that I lived almost my entire life, you know, 27 years sober, no chemicals and very, very clean diet. So like that has a lot to do with it. Anyway, uh, I did have some feelings of unworthiness come up in light of the gravity of what we've already seen. So if you haven't seen the previous shows, you are going to be amazed. Um, what we've gotten now is, is many, many pages of data that very precisely describe what's going on right now. They talk about it in such specific detail that to try to say that it's not real is, is just foolish at this point, I think. And you're gonna see even more of that today. It's just absolutely undeniable. Now, what's interesting about this, the only reason, I mean, it would, it would be amazing no matter what. Getting any, any type of time loop of prophecy that's this uh, comprehensive would be amazing no matter what. However, when you then take into account the, the enormity of what they're telling us is going on in the world today, right now, that's where it gets really exciting, because what they're saying is that all of this is part of a structured design that they authorized. They allowed this to take place with, with very special caveats, okay? So when I look at the history of prophecy and I think about, did anybody else have something this comprehensive as, as a prophetic source of data? And there is only one. It's the Sybil of Cumae. Now, the Sybil of Cumae was a woman who lived in uh, 540 BC. She was in the far western territories of Rome in the volcanic regions of Mount Vesuvius. Uh, so when you get volcanoes, you also get underground lava tubes, in some cases, whole complexes of lava caves. 
So she actually lived inside a cave complex that had about 130 openings in Mount Vesuvius area. So this woman would actually get a hallucinogenic high from the gases inside a volcanic grotto. There's a, volcanoes give off a gas called ethylene, which is actually a psychedelic. She would enhance the effects of the ethylene by using bay laurel leaf extract. So please do not try this at home. Please do not take bay laurel and go huff over a volcano, okay? It's not a good idea. This is the very bizarre method by which she was able to get into a state where she started, you know, acting like a rabid animal, groaning and, and you know, uh, and making, you know, noises and, and pulling her hair and freaking out and in a kind of a spastic state. But in this state, she was able to write things down. She wrote them down on leaves from an oak tree, believe it or not. And so she put the oak leaves out in front of one of the 130 entrances to the caves. And people would go by and they'd find the leaves, they'd read the prophecies, and the prophecies would come true with stunning accuracy. So this was working over and over again. A lot of people started to find these leaves and eventually the word got back to the emperor or at that time he was just the king. His name was King Tarkin. So King Tarkin says, I want to know what's going on with this lady. So please bring her to see me. So she finds out that, that she's been summoned to see the king, but she doesn't just come empty handed. She comes now with nine books that she's created. The, the pages of the books were actually made from oak leaves. And believe it or not, this is why we call pages of a book leaves. It's more of an archaic reference, but it's still sometimes used. So she said, it, within these nine books contains the whole future history of Rome, the future history of Rome. So King Tarkin said, I don't believe you. And she says, fine. So then she burns three of the books right in front of him. The priests are like gasping because they know how valuable this material is. Months and months go by. The priests keep making another case. They bring her back. And now she's trying to sell six of these books to the king, but she still wants nine bags of gold, which is the same price she asked for last time. And a bag of gold is huge. It's an enormous amount. It wasn't until the, th so, so he says no again, right? So then she burns three more books. So by the time they brought her back the third time, there's only three books left. And the, the priests are begging the king, I don't care what you do, please do not fail to buy this book. We will, we will give you everything we have. Just do not fail to, to let this book be granted. So the king actually paid her. And they took multiple donkeys and they hauled all these bags of gold back to Mount Vesuvius, which is a long distance from where they were. And then they got really excited because now they have this book that's supposed to tell them the future of Rome. Not only does it tell you the future of Rome, it tells you when these events are going to happen. So the king is trying to outfox problems. And so the first thing he does is he says, okay, let's look ahead and see what's the next problem that we're going to have and, and find out how to fix it. So one of the first ones they found was that the book told them that in the spring there was going to be a famine and everyone would be starving. Well, this is easy enough to fix. Let's, let's prevent this, right? So let's take all the food and we'll store it inside a vault and we'll put it under armed guard. Nobody can get in there. Then in the spring, we know we have the food. So this is what they did. When the spring came around, the food had been rotted out because of a, of a water leak into the, <laughs> into the area. And so sure enough, they had a famine, but it was because they tried to prevent the famine. So this is where the leprechaun wish thing got started. Multiple instances where they tried to see their future, and then by seeing the future, they actually caused the prophecy to come true. Now, this makes sense because I don't think these ETs liked the Romans very much, so they certainly weren't going to give them a military advantage or anything. Well, what ended up happening was that they would only look at the books when there was already a grievous national emergency. They kept the books hidden on the highest hill in Rome, Capitoline Hill, they had the biggest temple, the Temple of Jupiter, and five layers of security so nobody could get in there. Because if a foreign country could find this, they would know when Rome was going to have the disasters and they'd be able to invade. So this book ended up being, these three books ended up being seen as so valuable that Rome declared it as valuable as an entire room full of gold. Forget about the fact they paid her nine bags. They'd take a whole entire gigantic room full of gold and pay to get it back. So they actually had many other 
wise women who they attempted to recreate this with. It didn't really work. After Rome collapsed, they leaked some of the stuff about the future because these prophecies didn't just go through the era up to around the time of Jesus. They actually went into our time frame because they're all chronological prophecies of the future history of Rome, right? So what they finally got to was, wow, now we have these future prophecies about about the founding of America, or what they interpreted that way. So they actually took one of her, first of all, Rome gave over the last of her prophecies to a poet named Virgil, and he actually wrote them up as eclogues. So if you do want to go and read the actual words of the Sibyl of Cumae, you can by reading Virgil's eclogues. And specifically the fourth eclogue is the one that they quoted from when we are looking at Novus Ordo Seclorum on the dollar bill. The original quote in Latin is Magnus ab intrigo seclorum nascitur ordo. And it means uh, the mighty order of ages is born anew. Okay, now what's the mighty order of ages? That's this 25,000 year cycle. If you actually read the prophecy from there, again, which they quoted, and this has been confirmed by the Civil War hero who, who wrote a letter to the Secretary of the Treasury. I've talked about this in many other shows. Okay, so what they're actually doing is saying, hmm, let's pay attention to this quote, because the Novus Ordo Seclorum part, yeah, mighty order of ages is born anew. That's the beginning of the line, but then it goes on to say, the boy will soon be born in whom the Iron Age shall come to an end, and the Golden One will arise again in the whole earth. Both the lofty virgin and Saturnian kingdoms now return. So Virgo, Saturn, they're talking kingdoms from other worlds, right? So they're talking about like extraterrestrials coming and returning to see us. They're talking about everyone on earth becoming the golden one who will arise again in the whole earth. And then the prophecy also says that there will be no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears on this new earth. Well, that sounds very exciting and certainly not in the least bit overdue. So after I thought about it more, the only other time that I'm aware of that prophecy that's more elaborate than what we're getting right now ever happened is the Sibyl of Cumae. Considering that this was the greatest treasure in the history of Rome, uh, that shows you how deeply serious this is taken. In other words, on the surface, we have the deep state trying to say, oh, we don't believe in anything paranormal. That's, that's not true at all. That this is a religion, and they are occultists, and one of the most valuable things to them is prophecy. So what's happening now is that because I played around with remote viewing uh, from 96 to 2000, and then again from 98 to 2005, I had a total of 500 clients where I actually would go into a trance and I would speak on behalf of these higher forces like Archangel Michael, although I don't think he ever came out in a reading. Uh, but I did client readings for seven years, and I had 500 clients, and then I stopped because I just had so much demand, and people were having a one-year waiting list or longer, and I was burned out, and I didn't feel like doing it anymore, and it wasn't necessary for me to do it anymore. The, the readings were telling me they wanted me to go for a larger audience and, and mainstream. So uh, anyway, there's a whole volume of, of data quite extensive that I put out on my website in 1999 because what was happening in 1999 is that as I got readings I would just dictate them and then into the tape recorder I'd transcribe them and then I was just uploading them onto my website without even really analyzing them or, or adding to them I just actually posted the transcripts so most of the stuff I haven't actually had the time to go back and look to see if everything that I'm going to read you in this episode is actually on my website but my original website name sounds like some weird vacuum cleaner. It was, I called it ascension2000.com because I didn't know but what it was going to happen in the year 2000. You know, at that point, I didn't have as much information. So you can go to archive.org, type in ascension2000.com, go back to my website, tail into 1999, and you can find these, okay? It'll be right there on the front page as the Archangel Michael reading. So they were published online. You can go and look for yourself. But the scope of what we're seeing, again, is so amazing because, I mean, I've had time loops and I had one that I talked about in Awakening in the Dream, but I've never had anything like this. I've never had so much detail, which we've now gone through in the last three videos. Uh, 
And then again, when I got into October 1999 last week, we find out, wow, there's a whole bunch of new ones. Well, before I did last week, I had this horrible situation where my dog got into the most dangerous fight she'd ever been in. You know, she'd never had to fight a pit bull before. And the pit bull, you know, had a spasm from, from her nearly choking him out in the fight. I talked about that. And so, so the intensity of that made me a little reluctant to want to unseal the next batch of prophecies. So as a result, I didn't actually look at the next batch of prophecies until this morning. And so all the slides that I've shown, showing you today, I built this morning. No other dog attacks, no other crazy stuff has happened. However, uh, in light of how amazing all of this stuff has been, uh, we have decided to add another bonus to your uh, upcoming course with me, the disclosure. Okay, so over to the slide now. This was my idea. I actually, they, they did really well. Lulu's team did really well in, in realizing the vision because I saw this book cover. It wasn't exactly the same as this, but it was pretty close. I saw this book cover in, in sort of like a psychic vision. So what I've, what I've decided to do now is that when you sign up for thedisclosure.com, you can even bring up that, uh, let's bring up that crawl on the bottom. And I just want to do this at the beginning because I always do it at the end, but I just want to do a little few, just a minute or so about this. So all, all of this time loop has now become so amazing that what I'm going to do is create an audio book. And, and so again, we just showed you the cover that we came up with where I'm going to unseal all the Michael readings. And I want you to have the opportunity to connect with this spirit directly. Uh, so I'm not going to do analysis and interpretation. I'm just going to actually read what Michael said. But because you will have seen these in the videos, I'm not going to like, I'm not going to withhold anything from the public. Obviously, these prophecies are very amazing. So please don't misconstrue what I'm saying. I do intend to make all of these public with analysis. What I also want to do, though, is read them in a cosmic voice. So it's going to be nice and slow and a very authoritative line read, as if Michael was doing this himself. So you'll be able to tune into his energies. And that, I think, is going to really add a lot of interest to the course, because clearly this whole course launch that we're doing has been seen in advance. Um, Michael, I, I now know that Michael must be around me, so I've started to talk to him directly. Um, and one of the things that's very interesting is, how two of the main leaders of, of this, Michael Lindell, Michael Flynn, both of them have the Archangel Michael vibration in their name. I am not saying that Archangel Michael is anything special, unique to me. It's not me, and it's, not, it's just something that used me because I was in the right place at the right time. So again, going back to the slide, um, this is what you're going to see when you go to the, the disclosure.com. Uh, I did a whole new photo shoot for you, right? I even, I even bought some new shirts. So you can go up there, and uh, one of the things you're going to see is a really cool video, uh, which gets into a lot of detail. It's totally worth it just to go watch the video, if nothing else, because it's long and amazing. And so on the page, we talk about some of the different things you're going to discover in the course. We're going to talk about the five different species of ETs that have actually died on Earth and left behind uh, remains that we can analyze. We're, we talk about the mysteries of Atlantis, the pyramids, and giants. We're talking about the scientific laws we missed that make anti-gravity and free energy a reality. How to study and prepare for human levitation if and when the physics are changing, because that's one of the things that beings keep telling us, including in the time loop you're going to hear, that we will have this ability. And then how hidden truths, ancient wisdom, and emerging technologies will solve Earth's crises. One of the really amazing things that we find out here is that... Uh, the same energy that causes anti-gravity and free energy also deradiates nuclear waste, believe it or not. So we can take out the radiation. And when you consider that there's many nuclear power plants in, in America that have an overabundance of, of spent fuel that they're still holding on to in the form of radioactive water in very large containers, we already have a potential disaster here in America that's extremely large waiting to happen, which is if we had catastrophic earthquakes, for example, along the Mississippi River Delta and that whole area up the Mississippi River, if we had earthquakes in these regions, you could get a very severe toxic waste disaster that would make it very difficult for anybody to live in America. 
So there's an urgent need for us to, because this is one of the things the cabal just did. They don't care. So they'll just leave that stuff sitting around in tanks forever, knowing that sooner or later this will happen. So we can clean up the earth. We have a garbage remediation technology also that we talk about a little bit in the show. In fact, uh, our own insiders have now revealed that there is a garbage to hydrogen technology. Well, before I only had a garbage to diesel fuel technology. Now we have hydrogen, which actually stores a lot better than diesel. It, the hydrogen fuel will last a much longer time in containers and hydrogen, when you burn it, it just turns into water. So there's no, there's nothing bad about this fuel. And so if we start taking all of our garbage and turning it into hydrogen, that's a really amazing thing. So as I've said in previous weeks, I've been doing these course launches now for three years, but covertly I was taking the money and investing in this technology. And I'm doing this for the betterment of everyone. Did I ever think I was going to buy some military base? Heck no. But that's what ended up happening. Uh, and the reason is because I saw a clear need for this. And uh, the military is being cooperative with us. They're going to allow us to do this. They're not going to get in the way. They're not going to, like, give us the gold or lead thing. Um, so so we're, we're taking action on this. And this disclosure course is the new insider. I mean, how long have we waited for a new insider? I've brought out uh, some of the most interesting ones of all time. I brought out Pete Peterson. Well, I, Camelot actually found him, but then he started to work with me much more deeply. But I'm definitely responsible for bringing out Corey Good. definitely responsible for bringing out Emery Smith. Both of them have had really amazing contributions that kind of interweave with each other. And then William Tompkins also kind of fed into that very nicely. But really, since William Tompkins... In terms of what I know and who I talk to and the real vetting when you have real insiders, there wasn't anybody else that I've seen coming forward since then of that scope and magnitude. So now what we have is a new insider who I've known and been friends with for 12 years, who worked directly with Pete Peterson on a number of classified programs, and who is considered by just about anybody I talk to on the inside, in fact, everybody I talk to on the inside, believes that Ben is the premier designer of, of powered flight craft, <laughs> whatever you want to interpret that to mean, in the world. So I will say that because we've been friends for so long, we get along famously. Um, the, the conversations are very natural. There's a lot of good humor. And it's, it's two guys who are very intelligent, geeking out on very interesting things with, except for the first episode, because it's five weeks with Ben, the first week, we don't really have any slides. Uh, we just kind of riffed and went free form. And I don't know, we got like five hours of stuff. I'm going to have to cut that down. But, uh, and some of what my wife did in her interview with him is also really amazing. And, and so Elizabeth's interview will probably be included in the first week of the course because she really got into the stuff about him getting pulled in when he was in eighth grade and making spaceship designs as an eighth grader that the Air Force got so interested in that they brought him in. Uh, ben is not prepared to say everything that he knows, uh, and you have to understand that we can't do more than a certain amount at this point. Part of it is just the credibility of our company, as I was talking about last week. But in the future, he may say more, and part of that's going to determine, on um, you know, what are we authorized to say and how stable is our company. But, you know, you just might find out that Ben's met a bunch of extraterrestrials. Okay, possibly. I don't know. I'm just going to say that's a hypothetical. But, you know, Pete definitely did. And so some of the ones that Pete has talked about that he met that we've referred to publicly numerous times. Look, the bottom line is, okay, let's just get right down to it. Now, now Ben isn't going to tell you this right away, or maybe at all, I don't know. But Pete, who we both knew and, and talked to extensively, if you get into what Pete was saying, he was the head scientist for the deep state for many, many years. They considered him like the new Tesla. And in fact, his grandfather was Tesla's lab assistant, so he learned all the Tesla technology from his grandfather. So actually, let's swing way the heck over here now because it's daylight time and I got a window behind me on the shot and sun's going to go down, so I might as well use it while I got it. Okay, so what did Pete actually tell us is going on? A lot of stuff, okay? What he said was there's five different ancient civilizations that they have found in covert secret research, five different ancient civilizations that have all uh, been here on Earth at different times in our history. And if you know where to look, you can dig up relics of their past. 
the interior of the earth, every insider tells me this is like bubble wrap and there's these big 20 to 40 mile wide caves everywhere. It's like they're all over the place. It's like, it's like a honeycomb. If you go down into some of those caves, you find very ancient cities and they're abandoned. And so in fact, there's so much archeological exploration that we need to do just on earth. Once you start going below the surface, it's, it's vastly bigger than we realize. And so Emery and others and Pete included have said that in fact, we, did, we have had multiple spaceships of extraterrestrials crash on earth. It's just that because of the way the earth is, you keep getting more land added on top. And so this is very consistent and there's periodic cat catastrophes on earth that, that just flood everything and get hundreds of feet of new mud or maybe even thousands of feet in some cases. So you have to dig down to find the old civilizations that used to be on the surface of the earth sometimes. So we need a lot of archeological research to find out what's going on, but we know there's five different races. We were reasonably certain that there was a group of reptilian humanoids that evolved on Earth originally. And this particular group was then essentially defeated by another group of extraterrestrials that are more human-like. Uh, and this group is, is sort of like the fullest extent of where a human being can go. So these beings had incredible capabilities, incredible telekinesis, levitation, massive, massive psychic powers like nothing you've ever seen. Even most of the movies we've seen don't really scratch the surface. I mean, for an, for an example, there was a story of one of these beings in, in uh, the Aquarian Gospel of Jesus Christ, which Casey's readings, Edgar Casey's readings said this was an authentic source. Apparently, this, this being was able to point his finger like a laser beam and kill a whole army just as it was running up towards him. He just wiped his finger across like this and made this laser, and they all fell down dead. And they were dead. And then, after this happened, he, he raises up his hands like this, and they all come back to life and reanimate and walk themselves into the river where they then drowned themselves to finish the job. That's the kind of scope of power that these ancient beings apparently had. And that's a very fearsome power. So one of the things that we hear about is that they are, the humans are responsible for bringing in the moon, stabilizing the earth, and getting it from a tropical planet to, uh, which supported reptilian life, to, to a more mammalian planet like we have now. So there's been a war going on between the Draco and these, uh, these humans, and that war continues to the present. Uh, the humans actually did lose. Apparently the Draco scored a very decisive blow against them, and they were mostly wiped out. Uh, so now what we're dealing with is a world where we don't seem to think that there's much going on, you know? And so... When you get into these secret programs, you find out that, okay, there's not only five different races that have been here for, for whole civilizations that colonize the Earth. We also have a number of spaceships that have landed here. And now, since really since the dawn of America, every president apparently was visited by human ETs that would appear in his office and would talk to him. Uh, the founding of America had... Um, what do we call him? St. Germain, who showed up inside the building when they locked it from the inside, gave a rousing speech telling everybody that they had to do this. They had to make sure that the American Revolution proceeded. They didn't know if it was going to work. It was 1776. They didn't know that America would, would form. So Gabriel, in the form of St. Germain, if you want to think it's Archangel Gabriel, that's one interpretation. One of the archangels probably showed up and did this. To, to form America. So they've always been here and beginning in like the 1930s, 1940s and so on, our government starts to have a more direct open relationship with extraterrestrials. There are very, very advanced extraterrestrial cities on earth underground. And some of those cities have now been jointly used with our government, with our military industrial complex. So the full scope of what's going on is very exciting because they're already here. The beings that have been helping us in our evolution, they never left, they're still here. And so as a result, people in the military industrial complex, when you get above a certain level of classification, you're going to interact with these beings on the job as part of your daily life. Some of them look like uh, 
you know, normal humans. There's a lot of them that are taller than us. Uh, there's humans with all different types of skin tones, pastel pink, pastel yellow, pastel blue, pastel green. Uh, there's short ones, there's tall ones, and then of course you have all different types of life that you see on Earth progress to human form. So you'll have, there's actually dog people, people that have kind of a, a canine looking face. There's, there's lion people that have a lion-like face, but they're otherwise human. Uh, and we see records of this in our history. We have reptilian looking humans, you know, in the, in the Hindu scriptures, they have the Raksashas and they also have the Nagas. There's Naga temples of people that have a snake-like bottom to their bodies. So you got reptilians, you got aquatics. So there's mer people, believe it or not. Um, and they're already working with our, with our military. It's, it's not like this is going to be a big surprise to a lot of people who have already been in this world. When you interact with these beings, it's usually telepathic. They don't need to talk with their mouths. They can, but they don't need to. And Pete would also talk about when he was at Area 51, some of these people would walk around and they would levitate a whole ensemble of like boxes and tools and objects. And they, and, and they didn't even need to think about it. The objects would just stay levitating with them as they walked around. He also said that there's, Pete also said that there's, at least one huge mothership under the ice in Antarctica and that we've been analyzing this since the 1950s and it's got amazing, amazing technology and capabilities. Um, everybody's room apparently, it would recycle your own waste and then you have a lawn and trees like fruit trees and a holodeck. So everybody had a holodeck that could make it feel like you were outside. So your room, you might go into this space where you have your own structure. You have like what looks like a living space and then you have grass and you have trees and it looks like you're like you're just living a life out in the country, but you're actually inside a mothership. Uh, they also found that the surface of the ship would heal based on if it's being sung to. So as the ice uh, melts and the water flows away from cracks, the cracks actually are closing up. So the ship has a self-healing capability, which is very amazing. Okay, so... That kind of stuff is, is in the canon of old Pete Peterson data that we're doing. But now going back to the slide, in this program, uh, we're going for, for a six-week online program where we're going to go as far as we can. We're going as far as we can. So Ben does let a lot of things slip throughout the class. So it's going to definitely be worth it because... One of the reasons we decided to do it this way is that the gravity of an insider like this coming forward publicly is so massive that, of course, it's going to get taken down. So this way we protect the material. We know you're going to be able to see it. So then when we go out to week six, we're going to be going into this course on biological levitation. As I worked with Ben on this course, um, I started to realize, you know, I think all anti-gravity is ultimately different ways of creating these little orbs. And once you understand what the orbs are, and the way that Ben describes it is that they're actually atoms. They're, it's, it's a type of matter that's being created. These orbs are very mysterious because they seem to convert gravitation into electromagnetic energy. And there's some Russian physics we talk about with that. But then in week six, what I'm going to do is, is realize, wow, you know, I think... All anti-gravity, all the different systems are, are the result of these orbs, and ultimately the orb is essentially a product of an intelligent fluid-like energy that is the universe. The universe is made of a fluid-like substrate. And what's weird is that the boundary between our reality and the parallel reality that's all around us where time is three-dimensional. This is one of the things that the law of one always talks about. Time, the laws of space and time flip inside out. So there's two realities. There's space-time and time-space. In the reality that we're in, we have three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. In time-space, our three dimensions of space actually become three dimensions of time. So when you go into this parallel reality, everything may look the same. This is the weird part because space and time are actually just different ways of measuring the same substance. Space is the substance sitting there and time is the substance moving, basically. So, and I'm simplifying a lot of very advanced extraterrestrial physics when I tell you this stuff, by the way. But anyway, to just try to make this simple, 
There is a parallel reality that's all around us where time is three-dimensional. And it's a question of how do we access it. Because once we access it, we can move in this parallel reality. You could actually walk in the parallel reality. And then when you, if you come back to our reality afterwards, you might have traveled in time. So we talk about this book by Jenny Randall's called Time Storms and many, many amazing cases of people seeing a fairy ring or some type of orb. Again, these are orbs that cause this. And so you have a time dilation, you have a time distortion when you're around the orb. And then the orb can actually pop you into another realm where it looks like you're still on Earth and everything looks normal, but you're not. You're inside out. And your body's also inside out. So you're in this totally separate reality where now your body becomes like a wave function as well as everything around you. But you can see things and you can physically interact with that reality. The only difference is that as you walk around, if you then get popped back in and you've walked a certain amount of distance, you will now have time travel. I'm going to show you how this works today. So some of this stuff is, is going to be free, but we go way more into it in week six because ultimately what I've discovered is there's, there's, a, there's a series of exercises that I, so they're telling me and so I believe if you start practicing them now, when the physics changes where you would be able to levitate, you'll be able to get it going a lot faster. I've been practicing this exercise, um, and I'll give you a very, very simple view of, of part of the exercise. Part of the exercise is that you go out into the woods and you imagine as you're hiking that you're surrounded by a white sphere of light. And so they gave me that part first. But then the really weird thing was when they said, so, so inside the sphere, you have to be fully protected. And so what I've been doing also is I'll, I'll like feel the sphere with my hands as I'm hiking. So I'll actually put my hands out and just imagine that I'm feeling this bubble. It makes it a lot easier to, to feel. Then the really interesting thing is they say, turn the bubble inside out so that now instead of protecting yourself from everything around you, the bubble turns inside out, but only for nature and only for the forest. And now what you actually do is you turn the bubble inside out and you have to wait a long time. You got to really get that, that bubble hard, you know, hardened up as, as something around you. You turn it inside out. And then what you do is you, this is what they, they, this is an exercise I was given by extraterrestrials, okay? You turn the bubble inside out and you inhale the forest. And I got to say, if you inhale the forest, if you do this exercise properly, you will just start sobbing your ass off. The, the, the forest magic, the tree magic, the Archangel Michael magic he's teaching me, you got to touch the trees and you're going to end up crying. Okay, so you, you flip inside out, you flip the sphere inside out. So everything is now coming in through the sphere, up through the bottom of your body and up through the top and you inhale the forest. And, and when you do this, first of all, you cry, but then you get this surge of power. It's really amazing. And I believe this is, you know, what they're telling me is these are some of the stages that will lead to levitation. There's other exercises that are going to go through in the class. But it's, week six is going to be amazing because I'm going to go through levitating saints, all kinds of great stuff. So we have, uh, as we see in the next slide here, we're, we have a complete audio and video training package. So everything is hosted on a new private site. You only need to log in once. It's really, really awesome, and you can watch it whenever you want. So you don't have to hit the live streams. If you get backed up, no big deal. We also have uh, specific meditation techniques and exercises to practice in your own time. I'm going to talk a lot more about this, this uh, inverted sphere thing that I got. And, um, and I'm telling you, it's, it's very amazing. And there's going to be a lot more of those. And then here, uh, we also will have a private forum, so you'll be connecting with a worldwide community of like-minded people to discuss this amazing material, share your experiences, give and receive support, and post questions for guidance. We also have uh, something that I'm doing with my wife, a dual hemisphere meditation called Expand My Awareness Now, Potent Meditation. You see, we had to be really on the nose. We, we wanted you to know that it was potent, so we have to actually say that. <laughs> or maybe that was what Lulu came up with, I don't know, but <laughs> it's great. I love it. <laughs> and then bonus number two, Flight in the Future, five top tech opportunities you want to be involved with. Uh, and also, you know, if, if you wanted to get a job with our company, being a, being a member of this class is certainly going to look favorably <laughs> in the future because we're going to have to hire thousands of people. 
And I'll be telling you where the factory is eventually, not right now. And then also uh, we, we thought about the idea that with these five different beings that we talked about, the five species on Earth, we're going to create some kind of artwork out of that, or maybe the light being, something like this, and I will autograph them. So, so you are going to have a beautiful autographed print if you take the class that you can put on your wall, and it's got my John Hancock or my David Wilcock, whatever you want to call it, you know? <laughs> so we're going to leave that one alone, you know, because there's, there's lots of ways you can use my name for humor, which we're not going to do today. You know, I've heard everything. So you, can't, you can't impress me. If you try to make fun of the name Wilcock, I've heard it, okay? Let's just put it there. So now I want to kind of go into uh, the science of levitation and what I was just talking about with time space, because this is very strange. Now, uh, in the disclosure, of course, we're going to teach you how levitation works, and we do really need your support. And this also is as a preliminary course to set up the stuff that's going to go much deeper. So what I wanted to do now is to show you that nature is just causing levitation to happen quite naturally. So the first example, back to the slide, comes from plants. And this is the work of Dr. Orvin E. Wagner. Here he is. So this is the Wagner Research Laboratory homepage, and uh, you can still go and see it today on dark, or it was there a year ago. Hopefully it's still online today. I haven't checked. Darkmatterwaves.com. If not, just go to archive.org. So he believes that dark matter, you know, we're, we're dealing with some kind of dark matter in the universe. And here's the title of his book, if you want to actually see the book cover. So dark matter, of course, is this idea that there's some hidden energy in the universe, hidden energy in the universe that's, uh, you know, invisible to the naked eye, but still has incredible power. The idea of zero-point energy, right, that one coffee cup full of zero-point energy is enough to boil off all the world's oceans instantaneously. So what that really is telling us is there's way, way more energy out there than we normally believe, and that energy is very, very intense. So in light of how much energy surrounds us, getting enough energy to do levitation or anti-gravity should be no problem at all. If, if one teacup of this energy is enough to boil off the world's oceans instantaneously, so literally every teacup of space, and you could tile out the space around you. How many teacups are just around your physical body? You know, the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, right? So any one of those is enough energy to boil off all the world's oceans. So there's definitely enough energy to power all of our machines, all of our devices. And when you build one of these portals, um, the energy just starts spilling out. So you get time travel, portal travel, anti-gravity, deradiation, and free energy all at once, once you know how to make these spheres. But wouldn't it make sense that Jesus was working on free energy, right? That, that these levitating saints who were soaring up into the air had some ability to access free energy and anti-gravity? Well, yeah, that's what we're saying. And, and it seems like you know, we're getting closer and closer to the fulfillment of the prophecies that ancient scriptures told us would happen, which is that once we go through this planetary transition, which seems to be happening now, on the other side, we now have amazing levitation and other powers. So is it there in biology? Well, Orban Wagner says yes. So going back to the slide now, what he looks at is the idea of a standing wave. So here you have a string. Just imagine that this is a string that's now been plucked between the two rectangular areas on either end. When you pluck the string, if you've ever actually looked at this, and it makes a sound, you're going to get a particular wave, which then shows up as a certain number of nodes along the string. So in this case, you can see we have a node on both ends, and then we have two nodes in the middle, so there's a total of four nodes in this particular waveform. Now, as the string vibrates back and forth, uh, as the string is vibrating back and forth, it doesn't move where the node is. It stays still at the node point. So the string is going up and down like this, but in the node point, it's, it's, it's actually not moving. And so he discovered that there are waves like this in nature, and we're going to talk a lot more about it in week six, uh, not today. I'm just going to do some of the simple stuff, because last week we talked about Cleve Baxter, where he was saying that plants can communicate, right? Plants communicate with each other, and they communicate with uh, all kinds of other things that are out there in nature. Well, 
Wagner discovered something similar. And you remember, too, that when Cleve Baxter was going to burn his plant, the plant started screaming. The equivalent on a polygraph, if a human was screaming, is what he saw before he burned the plant. Wait a minute. You're saying plants are intelligent enough to anticipate disasters before they happen? Yes, apparently they are. Well, here's another really great scientist who's nobody's ever heard of him, but he, he discovered the same thing. Back to the slide, trees are talking to each other in what he called W waves, okay? So here's a page of Wagner waves, because he named it after himself, which I would have done the same thing. And they'd be called the same thing. They'd be Wilcock waves, right? <laughs> w waves. Physicist Ed Wagner says he has found evidence that trees talk to each other in a language he calls W waves. He says, if you chop into a tree, adjacent trees put out an electrical pulse. This indicates they communicate directly. So what he was doing, very similar to Baxter, is he sets up this, this situation with the trees. You chop into one tree. He's got another one wired up with galvanic skin response, just like Baxter did. And as he chops into one tree, the other tree screams. But in his case, he actually measured the speed that the wave travels, which is really cool. Explaining the phenomenon, Wagner pointed to a blip on a strip chart recording of the electrical pulse. The other tree, not the one that got chopped, but one nearby, put out a tremendous cry of alarm. Well, this sounds very familiar, doesn't it? The adjacent trees put out smaller ones. So the closer the tree is to the one that's getting chopped, the louder it screams. And that actually makes sense. Wagner, who is now 58, holds a doctorate in physics from the University of Tennessee, he formerly worked at the Oak Ridge National Laboratories in Tennessee and taught physics at Cal State Polytechnic Institute for five years, Caltech. So he was a Caltech physics professor for five years, and he worked at Oak Ridge in Tennessee. He returned to his family home in Weimar, about 15 miles east of Grants Pass, Oregon, in the 1970s, and established the Wagner Research Laboratory. About six years ago, he earned a degree in electrical engineering from the University of Dayton in Ohio. Wow, he got another degree. An abstract of his research was published last fall in Northwest Science Magazine, put out by the Northwest Scientific Association at Washington State University in Pullman, Washington, next door to Oregon. People have known there was communication between trees for several years, but it's typically explained by the chemicals that trees release, he said. But I think the real communication is much quicker and more dramatic than anything with chemicals. These trees know within a few seconds what is happening. It is an automatic response. Wagner measured the speed of his W waves at about 3 feet per second through trees and about 15 feet per second through the air. Isn't this weird, right? So there's, it's not chemicals, and it's a wave that goes 3 feet per second through trees and 15 feet per second through the air. So it goes a lot slower through the trees than the air. Three feet is a lot lower than 15 feet, right? That kind of makes sense, right? That the, the air maybe has more energy in it than a tree. It's, it's got more of this free-forming energy that can just, you know, travel apparently 15 feet per second through the air. But again, this is not electromagnetic. These are not electromagnetic energy forms. So Whatever is doing this at 15 feet per second in the air, 3 feet per second in the tree, it's not, it's not electromagnetic. So here's what he says. They travel much too slowly to be electrical waves. They seem to be an altogether different entity. That is what makes them so intriguing. They don't seem to be electrical waves at all. Wagner said he stumbled across the W waves early last year while doing research on sap flow in trees. He was intrigued to find different electrical voltage readings at various locations in the sections of tree trunks he was working with, indicating a standing wave formation. So this is something we're going to go through a lot more. Um, it may actually be that Wagner has discovered a sacred geometry connection that helps us understand these orbs that we want to form to be able to levitate. So the first exercise, again, is you create the sphere. The second exercise is you flip it inside out. The third exercise is you inhale the forest, and the fourth exercise appears to be that once you're good enough at inhaling the forest, you will lift off the ground because you're inhaling energy that causes you to lift. This is how it's been explained to me, okay? But there's a lot more to it than that. Okay, so uh, anyway, isn't it fascinating that at various parts of the tree, the electrical readings are much, much stronger, and he, and he found a standing wave? Well, yeah, we're going to see that in the course, what that is. 
Wagner said his work has been greeted with skepticism, but he remains confident it will be accepted one day. Scientists are supposed to be open-minded to discovery, but if you come up with something that is contrary to scientific religion, it's hard to get through to them. Well, don't we know? So now from his website, he talks about his anti-gravity research, which is really amazing. The plant division of Wagner Research Laboratory has experimentally found unique answers for the following questions. How does a plant respond to gravity? What implements the macroscopic structure of plants? How do plants communicate with each other? How do plants interact with electric fields? Do plants produce their own gravity-like forces and can one measure energy within plants? So what he's doing is he's researching sap flow. And of course, sap in a tree is gonna flow from the roots up to the leaves and the leaves have these openings on them called stomates. The traditional view of how sap is, is being flowed is that there's a pressure differential caused by a vacuum coming through the stomates and it's the vacuum that essentially pulls the sap up. Well, Wagner discovered something and, and you know, it doesn't really make sense. Honestly, it doesn't make sense that there's a vacuum through these little holes in the leaves and that everything's like a vacuum system pulling up the sap. It, honest to God, we don't know how sap travels up through a tree. We don't know why the sap is rising. We assume that we do but we just have these kind of crappy theories that don't really explain anything. Well, back to the slide. Dr. Wagner starts doing his own research on sap flow and how does sap flow up the tallest of trees? So I'm gonna read from his thing now. For many years, most plant physiologists have been pushing a theory of sap flow called the cohesion hypothesis. This theory has definitely never been shown to be the complete answer, but over a long period of time, since nothing better was offered, it has now become completely accepted, such as in chapter four of the book, Plant Physiology by Salisbury and Ross in 1985. So then I looked it up on Google and it, the cohesion tension hypothesis, sure enough, a hypothesis, meaning it's not proven yet, that explains the, the levitation of water from roots to leaves in the plant as due to a combination of upward pull created by transpiration losses producing a tension on the xylem vessels, meaning transpiration means the evaporation of water. Uh, you know, So transpiration and cohesion of water molecules to each other. So the water has to stick with the other water so that it can get pulled up, which also is kind of silly, aided by the adhesion of water molecules to the sides of the narrow vessels. So basically what they're trying to say is, okay, well, water sticks to other water and the water sticks to the sides of this uh, this little tube that th is going up through, and then all the rest can be explained by transpiration. Okay, so this is the stomate. This is the area underside of a leaf that opens up to breathe. And so what they're saying is that as, as water, I guess, is escaping from this, that it creates a vacuum and it sucks up the sap like a tube. Well, so here's, the, here's stomates on the back of a leaf, and here's somebody talking about the transpiration cohesion model. You know, and so again, you see that, okay, the uh, water evaporates through the stomate in the leaves, and apparently they think the evaporation causes it to pull up the water. Here's another graphic of the same thing, where it says in the top right there, transpiration, water evaporates from the spongy mesophyll cells and diffuses into the atmosphere, and then they believe this is creating a vacuum pressure. Well, it might be right, but it's apparently a much better explanation that he found, as you're going to see. Recently, there's been a revival of research that limits the usefulness of this hypothesis, and he gives an example. No theory published in the current plant physiology literature seems to completely solve how in the world is the sap actually rising. It's so simple, right? All plants are doing this, but so basically every plant must have anti-gravity is what he concludes. At Wagner Research Laboratory, we used a completely different experimental approach to find out how sap flows. In our case, we cut tiny holes in the sap conducting tissue or xylem of the tree. So he's actually, he's got to strip off the bark. He's got to cut into the tissue. Okay, let's go back to camera here. Cut into the tissue and, and then, so, so you, you strip off the bark and then you, you kind of drill a hole or cut a hole into, into the actual part of the tree where all the sap is rising. And then check this out. We placed small metal encased accelerometers in these holes. So here's a graph of what he's doing. So he's, he's stripping off the bark, cut, drilling a hole into the side of the tree. 
and then he puts in an accelerometer. Well, what's an accelerometer? Well, what you're seeing here, clearly he's got like, he's, he's put kind of paper inside the, you can see in, in the circle in the middle that he's put paper in the hole. And then he's got these two electrical wires and then they go to this machine, which he's got on a, on a it looks like a typewriter or something or a printer which is what it's doing, it's printing out a graph of the tree's gravitational strength. So this is what it is, it's a gravity detector, folks. An accelerometer detects how gravity is flowing. How is gravity accelerating? So what do you think happens when you, when you drill a hole into the, the, the side of a tree and then you put a gravity wave detector in it? Well, conventional scientists would tell you nothing but Wagner is not a conventional scientist and he replicated this over and over again. You can probably guess what's gonna happen. The accelerometers isolated from the tree tissue, and we saw how he did that with the paper, indicate that there are forces present when the sap is flowing that at least partially are canceling gravity to facilitate vertical sap flow. Similar forces were found to facilitate horizontal sap flow in the roots. So just whoa, 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 whoa. This is what's happening, folks. There is an anti-gravity machine that the simple shape of the tree is making. The tree itself, any plant, because remember, this is not just trees. This is how all sap is flowing up through plants, right? A plant is an anti-gravity machine. It's making an anti-gravity vortex as, as a living thing. It's actually the, the shape of the tree itself, I believe, and the angles of its, of its branches, and we'll talk about this in week six, how I think this is working. The tree itself, by its very shape, creates a passive levitating power. And the levitation is strong enough that even with the, the tree not being there, uh, even with, with the bark not being there, right, and you drill a hole in, you stick the gravity wave detector in the hole, it's still getting the anti-gravity. So just to preempt week six a little bit, here's what I think is really going on, folks. I said everything comes down to an orb. You have to create these orbs. Well, the, the tree already is in the shape of a toroidal orb, isn't it? The trunk of the tree is like the middle of the orb, the middle of the torus, the hole in the middle of the donut. And then the, the lower roots are, are creating the bottom of the sphere and the branches create the top of the sphere. And then when you get into his geometric branches, you, you'll see all the sacred geometry we've been talking about. So literally the tree itself by its shape is creating this spherical field with a, with a hole in the middle. And the hole in the middle is an energetic wave which when you create one of these spherical waves you're gonna get levitation in the chimney area, right? So literally the tree is building itself into the shape of something which it then attracts by its structure. The shape of the tree itself creates this portal automatically which causes gravity to flow in the opposite direction, thus lifting the sap up into the leaves. None of this has to do with, with the cohesion hypothesis. This discovery, as he says, limits the application of the usual hypothesis. The Wagner accelerometer results have been published in Physiological Chemistry and Physics in 92 and 95 with another article published in 96. So it was published in a scientific peer-reviewed journal. Wagner's book, Waves and Dark Matter, brings most of the material on this subject together. Gravity-like forces provide a good explanation for sap flow as it goes up tall trees. These forces appear to complete the cancellation of gravity and other resistance to the flow of sap and can be changed as necessary to accommodate the needs of the plant. The forces that we found may be related to moving standing waves that exist in nature. And then he talks about this article. We'll get more into that in, in the week six. So then this is, this is another really important thing off of his website that I wanted to get through because he starts to get into percentages here, 25% reduction in gravity. So here's where he says it in part five of this paper, measurement of the gravitational field within small holes in the xylem, again, this is the part of the tree where the sap rises, using tiny gravity wave detectors or accelerometers and hanging weights in vertical holes in leaning trees. Isn't that interesting? Even a weight and the amount of weight that the weight seems to show on a scale, right? So he, he had more than one way of detecting this. He found a 25%, up to 25% reduction in gravity inside the tree when it's near its maximum sap flow. So again, 
all you have to do is cut a hole in the side of a living tree and, and then find out what's going on in there with an accelerometer, a gravity wave detector, and you got a 25% reduction in the strength of gravity. So that's, that's amazing. And then he says, also forces were measured in horizontal routes, which indicated assistance to the sap flow. I attributed these forces initially to moving standing waves producing the forces. The gravity-like forces measured at the 25% strength, right, apparently were just a small indication of the real gravity-like forces involved because of the disturbance of the plant's tissue by placing the gravity wave detectors inside. So again, when you do this, when you cut a hole in the side of the tree, you're breaking some of the wave, and so therefore he believes that if you didn't, if you could somehow avoid breaking the wave, which you really can't, you can't really get in there and measure it. But if you if you could, it's going to be a 100% gravity reduction. So the 25% is only because you cut the hole. But still, I mean, if all trees are doing this, and this has been around us the whole time, and everybody's like, yeah, you know, trees just kind of have this liquid that goes up and rises up through their trunks and yeah, whatever, you know. No, 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 it's anti-gravity. Anti-gravity is the reason why sap rises in plants. And he proved it. So then he says, the brass shielding of the accelerometers and the distance of the accelerometer from the tree tissue indicates that these forces are gravity-like. They are not based on the Casimir effect or van der Waals forces. And another really strange thing that he found out which again suggests that anti-gravity is a very natural part of the Earth. We just think that gravity only moves in one direction. Well, not if you're a tree, right? Trees know how to grow into the right shape to, to harness these fields. As the temperature goes down, the anti-gravity goes up. And this is, so you can see this on the graph here. So on the top line, near the top, it says, you know, 2, 3, August 1991. And then it says temperature in degrees Celsius. So the top graph there is the temperature. You see it goes up to, uh, on the right-hand side, it goes up to 28 degrees Celsius. You can see that on the right side, y-axis. And then on the left side, y-axis, is the gravitational decrease. So for some strange reason, there's a direct relationship between the amount of temperature on Earth and the amount of anti-gravity force that trees are making. I, I want to be on the real close-up one because this is crazy, right? Let's go to this camera. I, I just created this new camera for you because sometimes I just like to shove it right in your face. Yeah. No, I just, I just wanted to have five angles. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a stickler. I can't help it. And because you guys gave me some extra money, I bought another camera. So there we go. So now we got five angles. Isn't this weird? I mean, like, wow. You've been putting out all this energy thinking that you know, we're in a dead universe, and, and this is what most people put out there, right? Like, ah, oh, there's no anti-gravity. And, and if you tried to tell the average person that a plant is going to have anti-gravity in it, they'd be like, oh, come on. We, uh, science has already figured all that out. Well, Newton, you know, when the apple fell on his head, nobody thought that gravity existed, and, and he discovered gravity by having an apple land on his head. There must be a force that's pulling this apple down so that it landed on my head. It didn't just happen automatically. There's a force involved. Sometimes we need to just have realizations. Sometimes we need to just think of things and then, and then test them. And so nobody ever thought to figure out if trees have anti-gravity that's causing the sap to rise until Dr. Wagner. He had it published in peer-reviewed papers, folks. He's a credible scientist who actually lectured at Caltech as a physics professor and worked at Oak Ridge National Laboratories. In other words, this is real. So wait a minute. If a plant can levitate its own sap, then why couldn't I do it? Well, levitating saints actually did levitate. And again, it all comes back to this spherical orb, this, this spherical torus with a donut hole in the middle. The, the, the tree... I believe from the moment that the plant starts growing, these, these, these bubbles of energy are around us in potential. And so you have to kind of create the bubble to, to, to use the bubble, right? So that's why in the exercise that I've been shown in the forest, you have to first create your own bubble. The tree does it automatically by its shape, right? But if you want to create an anti-gravity bubble, you have to first envision it as this sphere of white light that surrounds you. 
And it was only a couple days ago that I guess it I guess it's Michael, whoever is talking to me, said, now you gotta turn the bubble inside out. You have to invert the bubble so that instead of protecting yourself from all negative influences, you still are. But now in addition to protecting yourself from all negative influences, you open yourself up to the entirety of the energy of the forest and you inhale the forest. Okay? So why in the world would temperature and anti-gravity be oppositely related? It would, it would lend itself to, to, to think that, you, that temperature gets in the way of the anti-gravity field, right? So if you have, what, what does heat do in the atmosphere? Heat causes vibration, doesn't it? So as you reduce these extraneous vibrations in the atmosphere, you get levitation. It's really, really freaking cool. The inverse relationship between temperature and anti-gravity. And sure enough, when we see UFOs that are back engineered, people like, for example, Ralph Ring built the Tesla turbine into a working craft with the help of Otis T. Carr. He was the main guy responsible. Ralph Ring's the whistleblower that came forward. And you remember that Ring said that when the anti-gravity field kicks on, that things get really, really cold. The ship gets cold. And also in the class, we're going to talk about Dr. Victor Schauberger because he discovered that these same types of energy vortices will naturally be created in water. So certain types of vortexes of flowing water, when the water flows again in the shape of this spherical torus with the hole through the middle, by simply creating a flow of matter, in this case, the flow of water, in that spherical torus shape where you got the hole in the middle and it's accelerating and it goes around, this is how you're getting anti-gravity. In this case, the fish levitate right up through a waterfall. And so the other thing that was so strange was that in Schauberger's research on this, when he created this, yes, it would cool down. He even saw rocks levitating in the stream. They'd rise up to the top of the water and then they'd freeze on the surface. There'd be a, 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 an ice ring that would form around the rock as it levitated up to the top and stayed there. Some of the strange things he saw you know, out there in Germany when, when he came up with all this. It's very, very amazing. So that's going to be coming up in week six too. But now I want to also preempt another thing I'm going to talk about in week six so that we don't go through so much detail. So here we go. Back to the slide. I want to share with you Dr. Viktor Grubenikov. Now, I did talk about him at the very end of, you know, the last few episodes I did of Wisdom Teachings on Gaia, and I'm going to take it past that point now. So Dr. Viktor Grubenikov was an insect scientist or what's called an entomologist. He studied insects. And he discovered what he called the cavity structural effect in which certain shapes are harnessing this invisible energy, which we could call torsion fields. That's what a lot of the Russians call it, uh, with all the expected effects. And he first recognized this phenomenon from studying honeybees. So since since I've already done this uh, on Gaia in, in great length, I'm not going to go through a whole lot of detail. If you want to reference wisdom teachings, uh, you can go do that. I'm just going to go into a concise summary of, of, his, of his research, okay? So what he's got here is an illustration of this particular uh, oceanside sand dune where he found an incredible number of bees' nests. So let's go to the slide here. If you, he's, he's illustrating this as a painter, but if you look on the right-hand side of this cliff and you see all those black dots, those are all places where large numbers of bees are flying in and out really quickly. It's terrifying, really, being around all these beehives. Well, he, he discovered that these beehive shapes have very strange energetic qualities. So what happens, back to the slide, is he fell asleep on top of that sand dune and as he did, he began having very strange biological sensations. This included feelings of dizziness, headaches, heat, tingling, and nausea. And the sensations disappeared when he left the area above the hive. Now, there is also a feeling, as he said, that your body seems like it's larger or smaller. And there was a sense that his body wanted to levitate. So anti-gravity was a part of this, but it's not... It's not always good. You know, these strange sensations uh, included dizziness, headaches, heat, tingling, and nausea, right? So, and then when he left the area, the sensations went away, but if he went back, they, they returned. Well, he says, is this related to being on top of all these uh, 
beehives, right? So back to the slide, he took some samples and he brought them back to his lab for study. So these are, it's, it's, a, it's, a, mud, it's a mud bee of some kind, so it makes its hives in the mud. And this is just a small amount of what it does. Well, what he discovered was that if you take these beehives and you put your hand over them, you can really feel an energy. And as you wave your hand over where the energy is, as you go over the bee, even with your eyes closed, as you go over the beehives, you can feel it. And so the very first psychic, the very first workshop I ever did uh, was in Tennessee in 1999. And I broke people off into groups and I had them close their eyes and hold their hands out like this and then have the other person put their hand through the middle, trying as hard as possible not to make any air. Most of our participants were able to feel the hands invisibly. You can actually feel other people's energy. And anybody could do this. It's just that we have such an atheistic society that nobody ever does it, right? But there's, there's a very noticeable energy. And so as you see here on the top of this illustration, he believes that this same energy, that the bees can feel it and that it, it shows them how to go home. And one of the fascinating things he discovered was that there was a beehive hidden behind a brick wall in a house where he lived. And the bees were trying to ram themselves through the wall. They knew the hive was on the other side of the wall. And whatever waves were telling them this, it didn't matter that there was brick in the way. The bees kept trying to hit the wall because they knew the hive was there because they could feel the energy. Very interesting. Then he discovered that you could take a big bunch of straws and bundle them together and you'd get the same noticeable effects. Well, then he starts to notice that these effects do really strange things. For example, with seeds, you could aim these emitters that he created at seeds and, and increase the growth or change the direction that the, that you could either change the direction the roots are growing or like in this case, because you see here the arrows are where he's shooting this beam that's caused by all the straws bundled together. The arrows are coming up from the bottom. You see all those white lines. And you can see that the, that the roots are growing away from the beam. So plants feel these beams. And these beams are the precursor to anti-gravity, I believe. So here's a case where he had regular seeds that he didn't energize. And then he energized them with the beehives. And they grow better at the same speed. It's in the same number of days. They grow more. Then he found out you could actually take beehives and stick them together and put them on top of a seat and have somebody sit under it. And almost immediately, you're free of back pain and medical issues start to dissipate. So this is actually a photograph of the little machine that he made like this. And there's different ways to do this. Another experiment that he recommends is that you take a burnt piece of charcoal, like a charcoal pen, because charcoal is very sensitive to these fields, and you wave it in front of a flower, and it will feel sticky, and it will actually want to point towards the flower, sort of like dowsing. Uh, so you can actually feel the energy fields of flowers without your eyes being open once you get attuned to this. Well, this is another thing that he did, and I actually replicated this at home. You, you take a, a, again, you see the jar on the bottom right. It's a, it's a burnt piece of charcoal inside hanging on ideally a spider web. So you find a loose, you find a spider web, you grab some of it, you get a burnt piece of stick, you could just burn a regular stick, and then you put it inside a jar and you cover the top and you put a little water on the bottom. And I just would take a pencil and put it over the top of the jar. I didn't do it as perfectly as he did here. Anyway, it turns out that this is a psychic energy wave detector. That's right. You can actually detect these waves at home with no technology and no budget by simply burning a piece of stick, hanging it on a spider web inside a glass jar with a little water on the bottom. And sure enough, as you see here, in this case, he's taking a big, big wasp's nest that he found, and he's aiming it at the, at the beam, and the energy that's given off by the nest will cause the needle to turn towards the direction that the beam is going. So... I actually bought a Russian torsion wave generator device. I'm not going to say how to get one right now because they can be harmful if you don't know what you're doing with them. But I was doing a lot of experiments with this device and I started to use the device in conjunction with this detector. And it is absolutely amazing because when you turn on the device, 
the, the needle will actually turn and rotate right in alignment with the beam. So here's an example where a scientist said this would work. I bought a Russian device that generates these energy fields even more powerfully than a beehive. I aimed it at the needle and sure enough, the needle turned. Now the weird thing though is that if you, if you get excited about this and it works and then you want to do it a different way, you want to do it maybe off to the right. It doesn't work as well. So the more that you try to do it in one area, the less effective it's going to be. And that's because of something that the Russians call latent vacuum structuring. In other words, these energy fields create currents that continue to flow in nature. They will just exist in nature. So for example, if I zap the beam in a certain angle, I'm creating a wave with a central axis. There's a central spherical torus with the donut hole in the middle. That's what's happening as I zap this area. So that spherical torus continues spinning and continues generating energetic forces, which again are gravitational because it's pushing against this charcoal thing. It makes it spin in a different direction. So once you've gotten that current going though, if you then change the angle and go off of a different direction, the original one you created is still flowing, so now you're fighting against it. And that was one of the fascinating things I discovered personally in this gravitational research is that it, it wants to do the thing that it's already doing. It wants to stay in the direction it's already going. So again, it all comes back to, can you create one of these bubbles of energy and get this thing flowing in one area? And, and if you're inside of it, then you might actually levitate. So here in the next slide uh, is an example of him using, in this case, insect wings. And we'll talk a lot more about this. He, he discovered a particular type of insect that would levitate as it flew. And uh, so here he's showing that when you generate these fields, you actually get distortions in the flow of time. And this is another one of the really interesting things that we'll be learning as time goes on is that changes in the flow of gravity also are changes in the flow of time. The two are interchangeable. The minute that you shield off gravity from a given area, you're also shielding off time. So this is where all the portal effects and, and all this kind of interesting stuff starts to happen. Another way that he found you could create these fields is by simply taking cardboard or paper, crumpling it up like this, and then, and then just building something like this and leaving it in your house will literally create the central axis of healing energy that will help everybody heal. You can do it with egg cartons, as he shows here, and it works very well. These are like the, the massive, massive egg cartons that you get at the store, not like the individual ones, but it would work with smaller ones too. And actually, if you have a bookshelf or a library, he discovered that all the pages of a book put together create these energy fields as well. And it works a little better if you open up the pages slightly, but you will get these detectable fields. Another way he did it is by little rolls of film, and you build them out into a cone, and then there in that glass jar is the same kind of detector with the uh, twig that's burnt, except that now he's got a heavier weight on one side so that it stays to the bottom and now it can point in a given angle. So that's kind of like an upgraded version of his detector device. And if you get these, uh, if you get these just rolls of film and, and you create this emitter structure, just like the emitters on the flowers, it causes that needle to spin around like an engine. It will actually keep rotating. And again, this is all stuff he's replicated. Other people in Russia have done this. It really does work. This is an ancient he uh, healing device from the 1800s that he now believes actually works, again, based on its structure. The Jews, uh, the Hebrews, have a teflon where they, they fold up the scripture of the Torah inside this little thing that they wear right over their third eye. And that's probably a very good idea, okay? And he talked about this, that you could build this particular metallic shape and people, you hold it in your hand and then people can feel something coming off it. And he apparently got this out of something from Egypt. Uh, he also shows how a pyramid with a hole in the middle that your little, your little uh, charcoal twig will feel the stick from the hole. And he even shows how one of the most dirt simple experiments you can do is have a pyramid that you build out of like metal pipe and you hang it off of a string in your room. And he, he talks about how if you hold your hands together like this, you got to get them about six inches apart 
and you want to feel like you're grabbing a, 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 a cylinder, okay? Just making this shape with your hands, it, 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 it actually causes energy to come out of your body that you can direct. So what he's showing you here is that simply holding your hands in this shape and then aiming it at a pyramid apparently will cause the pyramid to start turning where before it had come to a state of rest. And I haven't tried this one yet, but maybe you'll try it at home. Give us, let us know what happens. So then he also noticed that there is a sticky area in the middle of a pyramid and energy coming out the top. Hence, pyramid, pyre amid, fire in the middle is what that word translates as. Another way that he was able to get this to work is simply taking a cone and filling it up with uh, heads of wheat. This gets a great big energetic kick because the wheat has a lot of energy coming off of it. So this is what he called the cavity structural effect. This feeling that you get waving your hand over beehives, waving your hands over flowers, but there's a lot more to it than this because this energy doesn't just create something that you can feel. In certain cases, it actually creates levitation. So nobody told Mother Nature, back to the slide real quick, nobody told Mother Nature that anti-gravity is impossible, right? We see it in trees. We see it in, back to this, yeah, we see it in trees. We see it in water. It's all over the place. Uh, the water vortexes Schauberg discovered caused these fish to levitate right up through a waterfall. And now we have trees. The real reason why sap is levitating through a tree is actually caused by the shape of the tree itself attracting or creating one of these bubbles where this energy starts to flow. So here's how Grebenikov was able to do this. He actually built an anti-gravity platform. Believe it or not, it's like the equivalent of an anti-gravity bicycle. And so uh, there's a whole backstory to how he did this. And in fact, uh, let's take another camera angle while I talk, tell you the backstory. We'll, we'll use the last few uh, minutes of my daylight here. because I'm, But I am going to finish more on time today. I think I'm only an hour and a half in and I'm already about halfway through. So that's good. I, I really didn't want to go four hours plus last week, but the Archangel Michael stuff was so amazing. I'm like, well, I, I got to get this out. I can't truncate this, this show. So I've actually created fewer slides this time. Okay. So anyway, uh, Bax, not Baxter, I was thinking of the guy last week. Grebenikov, again, is an insect scientist, and, and he noticed that there was one particular type of very, very large June bug type of beetle. It's all black, and, it, and it's very large. And he's thinking to himself, how in the world can these insects actually fly? Uh, they don't look like they should be able to fly, and yet they do. So in this case, the bug has wing casings, which are a lot harder, and that's the part that's black and shiny on the surface of its body. These wing casings then pop up like this, and then underneath are the wings that start doing this, but the wing casings pop up first. Now, at some point, he decided to see what would happen if I just take the wing casings off of these, there was one year where there was a whole bunch of these beetles that were formed. And he collected a bunch of them, because you know, they only live for so long. So he, he collected some of them that were either he killed them, entomologists usually kill the insects themselves. Sorry, but they do, right? So yeah, he probably killed the bugs. But anyway, he took the wings off and very, very strange things started to happen. When you take these wings, these wing casings and you push them near other wing casings. And I'm going to show you film of this in just a minute because there's these Italians who actually found out what species it is and replicated this and filmed it. Okay. When you take the wings and you push them against each other without actually touching one wing will push the other wing away. And he was totally mind blown when he saw this because this implies that as the wing casings pop up, that there's some kind of anti-gravity effect inside the wing casings that allows the beetle to actually be able to fly like a cheat sheet or something, where otherwise he couldn't. So the first thing he did is he started to notice that they would push on each other, and you'll see that in the video. And then he actually took uh, more than one of them and stacked them on top of each other. He, he bound them into a stack. And, and then what he found was that he could take objects and drop them on top of the space above this stack of wings and they would hover in the air 
or they would kind of fall off of an invisible energy field. And he tried it over and over again. And, and, and the, the, the feeling of, of intrigue for him was absolutely staggering as this was going on. Because he's trying to drop things on empty space and it's falling on a, on a force field. You're going to see this in the Italian films, macroscopic objects doing this. It falls on the force field and then it kind of falls off to the side. At some point, Grebenikov said, well, is there a way that I could actually, you know, stop this, stop anything from falling off? So he took a stack of wings and then he took a tack, a thumbtack, and he forced the tack to be bundled together with the wings. The tack apparently dematerialized. It was no longer visible to the eye. And then when he detached the area that was holding the tack, it came back into visibility and fell off. But there was an optical invisibility of the tack above these wings, and that is a very, very strange thing. And again, it seems that once you actually do create anti-gravity, you automatically have a portal. So as soon as you get anti-gravity, you have something that will send things into this other reality that we don't see, the three dimensions of space and time, where there's three dimensions of time, that's time-space, a parallel reality that's all around us. And how do you get there? You shield off gravity, right? So sure enough, just like the physics would say, when he shielded off gravity around this thumbtack, it became invisible. And then when the thumbtack comes back into visibility is only after he gets it out of the way of the field. In, I think, week four of our class, we talk about another substance that this was discovered to have happen where it would optically become invisible and all of its weight would leave the scale and then the weight comes back when you cool it back down. You have to heat it up to 850 degrees Celsius. Ben explains that, yes, this particular material is quote-unquote very interesting. So apparently there are some strange materials out there where just in this case heating them up can cause them to have weird dematerialization effects. And we explain all that in the class how that works. So at a certain point, um, once, once he saw the tack dematerialize, he got very, very excited. And he started to take all of these different wing casings and, and lay them out in a, a matrix. So he's got like a, let's say there's a, the equivalent of like an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, okay? Except that it, it's like a, maybe it's metallic or some kind of material. And he just has the wings in, the, in this even grid. There's, there's a set of wings, set of wings, and they're all kind of side by side. Uh, what do you, like, like if you're looking at watercolor paints, right? You got a bunch of different watercolors and they all have the same sizes, but they're different colors. Well, what he found was that the way that you get this effect to work is by sliding one layer of wings over the other layer. So if they're totally in alignment like this, then you get the gravity effect. But if they come apart like this, they don't. So what he was, and this is actually something that he's showing you, just going back a couple slides here. I'm just going to pull that up again. Oh, it's a lot of slides. There we go. So this, this slide is an example of insect wing casings or something thereof where he's got two layers of them in the, in the glass rings that you see, and, and he's superimposing them over the top of each other. Okay. So it's the same principle where if you take the wings and you layer them over the top of each other like this, and let me just, as I'm telling you this, I'm going to get back to the right slide. Okay, uh, so as, you, as you're layering, okay, we're back to that. So this is the, the platform that he eventually built, okay? Now, uh, this, is the, this is the site where they actually replicated this, and we're going to get back to this in a second, okay? So what is going on here? If you look at this, this is his anti-gravity bicycle, and apparently it really did work. So in the main thing that you're looking at is the, is the wood box at the bottom. And inside that wood box are really only two layers of the wings, like watercolor palettes. And then he's got bicycle calipers on the tops of the thing, if you can see back to the slide. And so in the same way that you would pull the brake lever on a bicycle, he had a lever back to, yeah, he had a lever where you could pull on it and it would cause one of the two plates to slide over the other one so the wings are in alignment. As soon as you crank that down, and, and, and how much the wings are in alignment is determined by how much anti-gravity you're going to get, by the way. As soon as you slide the two of them together and you pull on the thing, 
this, this platform literally levitates off the ground. And then shortly after it levitates off the ground, you become invisible. And if you can see anything, it's only like this, this amorphous blob of light. Well, this is because he's now popped over into time space where time is three-dimensional. And that's what he's now using as space. And so the only part of him that we can see is like a wave function, so it appears as amorphous light or just invisible. So this actually did happen. Now, um, he, he, he reported, by the way, some very phenomenal time travel effects where he said that he would travel on this anti-gravity platform. He was amazed. He, he would be high up in the air. A lot, of the, a lot of the navigation was controlled by your body, so he would belt himself to the platform so that he doesn't fall off, and you got to kind of lean in on it. And so it has to do basically with how much gravitational lift you're doing with the bicycle caliper and then basically just leaning in with your body to steer. But he could levitate very high and he was willing to do these tests and, and he flew, you know, huge amounts of feet off the ground and he would travel to other places. Well, then when he got to these other places, something was wrong. The trees were more ahead in time than they should be. They were further ahead in their maturation than they should be. And he knew what, what level of growth they should be at, but he, it appeared that they were like, you know, a few weeks into the future or, or longer. So he kept trying to figure out, is there, is there any way I could prove this? So at one point, he, he started to try to bring back insects because, well, if the insects, you know, don't look the same as they did, if, if they could somehow revert, and maybe he could catch this. Well, one of the strange things was that every time he tried to bring an insect back in a test tube, it would, it would leave just this burnt hole in the tube. And we'll show you that later on. But finally, at one point, he, he, he got an adult species of an insect called an ichneumon. And when he brought the ichneumon back in the tube, it had regressed into a larva inside the tube. So it actually traveled backwards in time. Well, this sounds very, very strange, the idea that a guy would build an anti-gravity platform out of insect wings, that he would travel into the future, and then he would be able to go backwards into the past. Well, let me tell you something. When he tried to publish his book on all this, and it was 500 pages long, the Soviet government demanded that 300 of the 500 pages be removed. He had to take all 300 of those pages out, and he had to completely rewrite the rest of the book. So there's something going on here that the Russians didn't really want you to know. And there's a lot of other research that describes anti-gravity and time being interrelated. But what really is so astonishing is what happens when these Italian researchers replicated his effects. So here it is, folks. Get ready for it. Drum roll, please. All right. So this, uh, I'm probably going to mangle the Italian because I've never learned Italian, but it's Esploratori PK. Un pianeta ancora scon, sconosciuto, something like that. So this is a forum that's online, or at least it was, and you can see the website there is emetica.net, E-M-E-T-I-C-A.net, okay? This is an online Italian discussion forum in which, as you can see here, they have a whole section called Grabenikov. Now, is this still online today? I don't know. It was from July 20th, 2011. I found it shortly after it came out. I don't know if this is still online or not, okay? But what they apparently did is they actually were able, because th this is the other thing that was so infuriating, folks. After the Soviet government had him redact 300 pages, um, they never, he never told you what the bug was. He, he kind of alluded to it, but he didn't actually say which one it was. So these Italians correctly figured out which bug it was that does this, okay? So here's the actual wing casings of the right insect that Grabenikov discovered. And here is an actual photograph of the correct bug that they found with, you know, when it's, I guess this one's dead, uh, but it's, you know. So apparently this species is called Elytra, E-L-Y-T-R-A. So that's what you need to find if you want to discover the secret to anti-gravity through insect wings. It's, it's a bug called Elytra. So they actually were able to find this, this weird bug. And they even took a picture of where they captured the bug. 
uh, and they have this. This is the device that they use to lure them in. I guess if you put the kind of stuff in there inside the bag or inside the water bottle that they want, um, they'll they'll go in there and then they get trapped and they can't get back out. So they're really easy to catch. So again, these are the wings. Now, one of the things that was really amazing to me is uh, they actually were able to do a scanning electron microscope photograph of the material inside the wings. And it has this very interesting circular structure. Now, what's weird about this, which you can't really tell from the picture, the way they've taken this picture, you have a circle and then you have a point in the middle. But those, those, those circular holes extend through the wing and they rotate as they go down. So it's like a rotating tube, like a waveguide. And so now I'm actually inclined to believe, back to the slide, that these little points that you see, the little tips that you see, is where the orbs, the little anti-gravity orbs that these wings are creating, they kind of roll off the tip. And so here's a wider, uh, another image uh, of, of how amazingly precise and geometric the matrices are of these tube guides inside the wing. So when you see the course, we're going to show uh, charge clusters and the way in which these are formed. A charge cluster basically is something that levitates. It has free energy and anti-gravity. So the cool part is we don't really need to solve all the problems of physics. So we don't, we don't necessarily have the unified field theory of gravity in our new class, but we're trying to understand, you know, you don't, need to, you don't need to have a working theoretical model of what gravity is, but if you know how to make anti-gravity, who cares? If it works, it works, right? So I think that what we're actually going to see here is that, the, that these little points create little orbs that are anti-gravitational, and that'll make a lot more sense when we get into the class, and I'll talk about it again in week six. But this is it. So, so Grabenikov's research has been studied and uh, this is something that was off of his website. It's one of his illustrations uh, showing kind of a little bit of, of the bug. It's not, it's not exactly the same because he didn't want to give it away. This is one of Schauberger's pieces of psychedelic artwork based on all the energy fields that he was seeing coming off of uh, beehives. And so this was Schauberger's vision of how crafts of the future could be built using his system. Uh, and, 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 and he's also illustrating the energy fields of anti-gravity here, as you see. So uh, we're probably not going to use insect wings, but, uh, you know, so this is actually the close-up view of the handlebars of his anti-gravity platform. And number one is, is an interesting thing. It's a toggle switch there. So apparently part of the secret is that you can't just have the wings sitting there. They have to also be static charged with static electricity now in 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 the in the bug the static electricity is caused by the wings moving and that generates a natural static field so you have to create static on the wings and the static electricity is what's going through these wave tubes and turning into charge clusters as they roll off the points on the ends as we saw so and then you know number two i think is his caliper that controls how close or far together the wing plates are now this is actually an illustration. So the way he designed the folds inside his device uh, is kind of like in this rotating uh, di diagonal lines coming off of the corners. So then they, they flip in and out like an oriental fan based on whether he pulls them together or closed. And again, they have to overlap each other to get the effect. So this is another illustration of when he was flying overhead. Uh, people would see UFOs when he was doing this. And so this was his envisioning of, of the fields that the craft are creating. People, so there were UFO sightings whenever he would fly this thing. People would see this sphere of light moving through the air. So this is a photograph of the surviving actual device. Uh, it's been detached from its base, but you can actually see he had a gauge here, I guess, which shows you how much static electricity he's creating uh, on that little gauge. And then, and then again, you know, he's controlling how far apart the wings are from each other. That's the bottom of the thing. And this is it from the side. And again, if this was so scary, 
uh, if, if, if there was nothing to this and this was fake, then why did the Soviets confiscate 300 pages of his book? And, you know, how did he end up discovering things that a lot of other researchers independently found? So here's some other parts left over from his device. And here's another picture of that thing that he says you can make, uh, which will create these energy fields naturally. And he's got some basic plans on how you could do that if you wanted to. Apparently, you'll really feel something, get a kick off of this. We ought to sell these, you know, what the hell? <laughs> They're not patented as far as I can tell. So anyway, um, now we're going to get into the stuff that's really going to make you blow your mind. So again, none of this really looks like it, it would be real. And I'm going to have to actually go over here to the desk to see this so I can watch this along with you because I can't see it on my laptop. So I'm going to narrate now as, as I play these because they're so amazing. You, you can stay there. It's fine. You can stay there. I'm just going to stand up. Okay, here we go, folks. So I'm going to, this is the first video off of the Italian forum. So here we go. All right, so what you're seeing here is, uh, this is just like a Gillette razor. And he's got one of those wing casings attached to the end of it, right? So he's got one wing that's on the thing he's holding in his hand. And now, whoa, look at that. If you take one wing casing and you, and you go after the other one, they start to spin by the energy fields. So now here's another example of this. This is another one of these wing casings. And just like Grebenikov discovered, oh, look at that. You see the gravity? You see what's happening? Whoa, look at it. It's trying to run away. This is not supposed to happen. It is not electromagnetic energy. This is an anti-gravitational force. Look at how they're getting stuck together. Oh. Now, see, anybody could do this. If you find this bug, anybody could do this. This happens to be what they did on the forum. You see how it slides off the top? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm blown away when I watch this stuff because, again, you're looking at effects that are impossible. Science tells you this is impossible. Science tells you this shouldn't be happening. And yet, I mean, do you really think these guys did all this fake? Do you really think they figured out a way to fake this? No. I'm sorry, folks. This is real. And, uh, okay, so now he's got one wing casing and he's bringing it out onto the table. So you can see it that way. Oh, they actually did. Oh. But see, even still, there's all this kind of funny gravitational nonsense going on here. Uh, but it looks like, you know, on that surface, he's getting more results. Okay, so these videos are very long. I don't need to show all of them to you, but I want you to get the gist of it. So now what we got here is... Uh, he's got this pyramid, okay, and it's a little, little pyramid, and now he's going to use, he's got some other materials, and now he's got one of the wings. So in this case, what is he going to do? Let's see, because I, I haven't watched these in years. <laughs> I know this stuff works. I don't need to keep watching it. Oh, look at that. Look at how it's sticking around. Again, these are strange fields that are, that are causing all this to happen. So let's see what else is he going to do here. All right, so he's bringing in the pyramid. Oh, the pyramid power affects the wings. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, the, the natural energy, just like we were talking about cavity structural effect, what comes off of the flowers, he's got the wing casings on top of this flat piece of something, and now he's going to bring it over the pyramid and check out what happens to the wings as they go over the energy that the pyramid is giving off. They slide away from it. So there's a direct relationship between the energy fields that Grebenikov discovered like pyramids and anti-gravity. If you're doing an anti-gravity device and you go around certain objects that have the right shape, it's going to push on them. Look at that. Look at how the currents coming off of this pyramid are not only causing them to move, they're causing them to rotate. So it's kind of like a rotational gravity field coming off of this pyramid. I don't even know if these videos are still online or not, folks. This was back from 2011. You can clearly see what's happening here. So here's another one. Uh, oh, yeah, look at that. Now, that's really amazing because what he figured out is how you can drop one on top of the other so it actually hovers in the air from the anti-gravitational field. That's very impressive. And I'll bet you that they might have some static running through that thing that it's on because you, static energy does help this work better. But again, it's not based upon static energy at all. It is an anti-gravity effect. 
Okay, so now he replicated another Grebenikov thing where he's got a compass and he's got these wings aimed around the compass and they just keep it rotating and rotating and rotating by the gravitational effects that they're producing. Isn't that cool? And it keeps getting faster. Look at that. I don't know if he does anything. Oh, that's the end of that one. Okay. Now this is where things really get weird where they actually take the wings and they bundle them together just like Grebenikov did and they stick them inside a box just like Grebenikov did. So that box that you're seeing there has the wings inside of it. And now he's showing you, yeah, this is just some kind of like heavy battery that he's got sitting around in the lab. What happens if you try to drop it onto the box or you just slide it across the box? Well, he's gonna slide it into the area where the wings have a, oh, wow. Look at that. I mean, what the hell? Because there's an anti-gravitational effect right there. As he slid it towards the anti-gravity, it just shoots up into the air and runs off. So I think he's gonna do it again. Again, I haven't even really ever watched these all the way through. Look at how old school that telephone is, man. <laughs> wow. It's Russia. What do you expect? Or Italy, I guess, right? It's an Italian. Oh, wow. Look at that. You give it a good hard kick and it just shoots up into the air. Now he's going to take this next just random object, something heavy. And watch what happens. Whoa. So there is a very, very strong anti-gravitational kick. Oh, look at that. There's a very, very strong anti-gravitational kick on this thing. And again, you know, if you're a skeptic and you want to be a jerk and you want to say, oh, David, this is, I can explain all this. I got a fact checker. Okay? Screw your fact checker. This is real. All right? I'm sorry if you don't want to believe it, but this stuff really works. So what you see right there is all those dots are where the wings are. You know, he... he, he created this whole thing so that there so that you get the effect and that where all the dots are is where the wings are actually located and you're getting this massive gravitational lift yeah, now he's going to pull some of them off i guess and anyway i mean i wouldn't know what he was saying because it's not in english but uh that's the box now he's going to do some more really crazy stuff with this box. So if you haven't already been blown away, this should help. <laughs> okay, so he, there's the box. And again, you know, it takes a little while to get going. He's got to kind of work his way into this. But there he is, and he's going to push it over, and the same thing's going to happen again. Oh, look at that. It doesn't quite have enough energy to get it all up. So that object, maybe because of the metal or something... Oh, yeah. It, it, it went finally, but it didn't go at the beginning. Now we have an ordinary ceramic mug, right? How's that going to... There's no magnetism on a mug. Boom! There it goes. Unbelievable, right? And then here's another one. I think this is a different one. Yeah. Okay, so now he's again just showing you the, the box and... Uh, He's got something on top of the box. He's got that crazy lame phone. I mean, come on, bro. You got to spend some more money on your telephones, I think. That's a little bit too old. But anyway, uh, here's the box. He's picking it up now. This is what's got the wings inside of it. I don't know if he's going to show us what's inside. Oh, it's one of those... Uh... Yeah, so he's got some of that stuff going on. That's the old-fashioned... Uh... Okay, but the wings are definitely in there. So anyway, okay, good. That's the last of the videos. <clears throat> All right, we're still only at 6 o'clock. This is awesome. It's two hours. So he actually was so worried about possibly being caught doing something with this that he, he des designed the whole thing to look like a painter's uh, suitcase. So he could camouflage it and walk around. I mean, this thing had no technology. And in this image, apparently, he had somebody take a picture as he first turns it on. And so this is apparently not some trick of him just jumping off the ground and levitating for a fake reason. That This is actually the beginning of it working. And again, once he goes more than a few feet up in the air, he, he turns into a you know ball of light. 
So this is him illustrating the travels that he made on this, on this device and him believing that there's some kind of gravitational bubble that he's surrounded by. And this is an illustration of what the Russian countryside looked like for him as he was flying through the air. And so then he would travel to this area again where the insects were, uh, he would sample the insect and bring them back in a tube and this is usually what would happen. That is a, that is a photograph of a, of a tube where he had taken an insect sample and then it does this very interesting ring-like uh, stain where the, the, the insect apparently is killed or at least portaled out and the only thing that's left is this weird ring. Well, the weird ring actually isn't a surprise because these energy fields when we go from space-time to time-space, it, it might actually be like kind of a, a planar movement. There's like a one plane, like a flat plane, in which the teleportation, or through which the teleportation actually occurs. And so in this case, it, it just kind of, the, 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 the body of the insect is now spread out in space and time, and it's, it does so along one plane, and apparently it burns itself into the two. But remember, he also found... Ichneumon and then brought it back and it reverted to a larva. So it was a, it was a larva in the tube even though before it had been an adult when he, when he captured it. Well, the Germans called their anti-gravity project Kronos. And I'd love to, you know, be able to get some of these wing casings and replicate this ourselves. I mean, the Italians already got pretty close. You saw the incredible thrust, the, the way that things just fly up into the air when they try to put it on there. And all this is being caused by insect wings. So, again, biology knows how to do this. Nature knows how to levitate. It's not a secret. And in our new class, The Disclosure, we're actually taking you through the process of how anti-gravity really works. And so once you understand what is being done and how it works, everything else like this becomes explainable. And right off the bat, I can see that the those those waveguides inside the wing have those little points that come off the tip. When you shoot the static charge in there, it's rolling off the tips and creating these charge clusters, which are anti-gravitational. And all this is explained in the course. So this is what I, I'm, I'm very excited about because we don't have to wait anymore. Anti-gravity is not that hard to do. If you think about just the, the, the strangeness, right, of an airplane flying on air and taking a massive metallic object and then trusting that it's going to stay up in the air on such an intangible medium. I mean, there's air around me right now. I'm not thinking that I'm going to be able to levitate a heavy machine on this stuff, but it's here and that's, that's how we do it, right? So in the, in the course, Ben says, yeah, there's other things besides air that you can use to levitate off of. It's very, very interesting. So what we're really doing here is bringing out a new insider for the first time with stunning information. Uh, and unlike any of the other things that I'm doing, I'm not just bringing out an exotic animal and putting him in a cage so everybody can say, woo, woo, look, that's like a purple lion, you know, or whatever the heck it is, right? <laughs> We've joked about this. My wife and I have joked about the exotic animal joke. We don't just want to put the exotic animal on display and say, wow, isn't it strange we got this purple creature? No, we want to build the technology. And, and Ben has the ability to do that. So I really do feel like we're in a Wright Brothers kind of thing here where if, if this gets going, we're going to have the ability to do some really amazing stuff. And I want you to, <laughs> I want you to have a hover car. I, I came up with a, this song kind of floated into my mind the other day. You deserve a hover car. And it's really funny. And I sing it like Louis Armstrong. You deserve a hover car. You know? I don't know. It's stupid. <laughs> I got the thumbs up, though. I guess they like the song. So, I, you know, I don't want to live my life going out there and talking about all this stuff so that somebody else later on can take the David Wilcock material and start doing really cool stuff with it after I'm gone. And so it was a big junction point in my life when I said, you know, I can go from being a reporter to actually being the people, being the person who gets reported on. Because if we do this, then UFO people report on it because it's anti-gravity, right? Well, I don't want to be the guy who just reports on all the cool stuff. I want to do cool stuff. 
people are always saying, well, David, you know, where's, where's your contribution? You just talk about other people's work. Well, how about that we make machines that actually levitate and fly? You know, the government's already done all the due diligence on this, by the way. They've already marked out the flight corridors for things like Amazon drone deliveries, which I hope to God never happens. I do not want to see a bunch of drones in the air. But anyway, they've already done all the red tape. We already have essentially roads of where, where these hover cars are going to be allowed to go. They will not go above regulation airspace, so they're only going to go up to a maximum of 2,500 feet altitude. And I guess our speed is going to be something like 250 miles an hour. But this is amazing because when you have a hover car, you don't need to worry about roads. You don't need to worry about airports. You can go anywhere. And there's massive amounts of the earth that are basically un unexplored, undiscovered. And hover cars also are an effective weapon against tyranny. Because when you have a tyrannical government, what's the first thing they try to do? They, they don't want you to leave. They don't want you to have any ability to go anywhere. So hover cars also free us from the possibility of being, you know, stuck in a given area. We, we have the freedom to move. So I'm really, really excited about the disclosure. I think it's the best class we've done yet. Um, it has hundreds and hundreds of slides. It's, it's totally, totally worth the time. And if you jump in now, we're giving you the Michael prophecies. We have this ebook that, because look, all this stuff is happening to me. And I said, okay, I guess the Michael prophecies are part of this. So now I'm going to read you actually from October 11th to October 15th of 1999, because that's all the time that I had for this show, because there's so much of this stuff with the time loop. So again, so that you don't get confused and you don't get lost, I got online in 95. I was listening to Art Bell. He was always, always talking about remote viewing, and he was encouraging people at home to try it. So I did. And in my case, I got a voice that was speaking about future events very accurately, which eventually, it wasn't like it started this way, but once I'd done the work long enough, apparently I was sufficiently tuned for Archangel Michael. So this is one of the other things that I want to share with you, okay? The very, very awesome and important principle of attunement. Archangel Michael didn't talk to me until after I received the telepathic contact with my higher self. I don't think Archangel Michael is my higher self. I think it's something else in this case. But again, I believe the Michael vibration is in Flynn and Lindell, people who have the name Michael. It's like some kind of soul signature. And my brother's name is Michael, so I have it around me too. You know, um, So I'm, I've always heard the name Michael my whole life. Obviously, if your brother's named Michael, you're going to hear it all the time. And then again, my father and my grandmother both would always end up calling me Michael and then when my gardener, an elderly man who has un undeniable psychic ability, just walks up and calls me Michael, this is very strange. So again, I'm not saying that Archangel Michael is me. I'm not saying that I'm a messiah or a savior. I'm just saying I'm a kid who listened to Art Bell, played around with remote viewing, got words in my mind that I dictate onto a tape recorder, and I transcribed them, and then I put them up on my website in 1999. So I'm just going to read you excerpts from that because I don't know how it worked, but now it's becoming very, very relevant to the present. So again, to get these kind of contacts to happen, you need something called attunement. And the way that I attuned was that I started to read the Law of One around January 15th or so, 1996. It took 11 months. And then I, by reading that material all the time and, and acclimating myself to the energy, I was able to receive contact myself. So with our, with our ebook the audio book called The Michael Prophecies. I'm going to read it to you straight off of the way it should be read, not fast like I do on these videos, but nice and slow. I might put some meditative music behind it sometimes. I don't know how much time I'm going to have. But my goal is to unseal all these Michael Prophecies. So that's going to be one of the special features that you'll get in the course. And I hope to do it fairly soon so that it'll be available fairly early. So you take it nice and slow, you listen to it. This creates attunement. Your vibrations get attuned to Michael's energies. And we're also going to have, as I said, that meditation with Elizabeth and me. And we're going to have uh, the autographed portrait that I'm going to send to you. So all of these things will help you to attune. If you listen to the Michael prophecies, if you listen to the book, and we'll, we'll, I'm going to include the transcript with it as well. So it'll be a physical ebook and an audio book. 
And that way it's all organized for you and easy to find. But uh, when you listen to this, it actually makes it easier for you to receive the same contact later on. So that's one of the great tools that these extra bonus materials will give you is the, the ability that maybe Michael is going to want to contact you too. I mean, I can't presume for one minute. I would never dare try to say, I am Michael's source. <laughs> Michael is not me. He might want to talk to you. The whole reason why I might be doing this is that you have to do this next. You have to start listening to them. They talked about this over and over again, how much they wanted a lot more people to start trying to do this. But again, you got to be really careful and make sure that you follow the protocols, as I describe in Awakening in the Dream. So I wouldn't recommend doing this unless you've read my book, Awakening in the Dream. Really study those protocols, because again, if you're angry, if you're sad, if you're hungry, if you're thirsty, if you're tired, all of those things can give you bad results. And how do you know when you have bad results? You get messages of doom. That's what the Law of One says. The best way to tell if somebody's getting negatively inspired is that they have messages of doom that tell you that the future is bad. It's not bad. So, again, last week, I had taken it up to October 10th, October 1st through 10th. We had an amazing, amazing time loop, and I'm not going to reiterate all those, but at some point I will. And when you take all the power quotes and you put them together, it's, it's just astonishing. And again, the only thing that's probably bigger than this and better than this is the Sibyl, Sibylline mystery texts, the classic Roman treasure that they said was worth an entire room filled with gold. And I want to say something else, too, that Archangel Michael, whatever it is, he is speaking directly to the deep state, and it's obviously not going to work out for them. So I think it's a good idea to take heed of this advice and just, you know, we don't need to push this any farther. So before I get into the actual things that he said, there's one more data point that I really have to install here, and that is, I got to know Pete in, in 2009, and then by 2010, I started to get all these very strange briefings from him that were Alliance briefings. Now, again, in 2009, he told me that there was a strong element of the U.S. military that is aware that the world is being run by some very diabolical Satanists, and that these people are incredibly dangerous and uh, that they're going to be stopped by the military, that there's been a plan in place since the 1950s. They had a five-inch thick binder. They'd already worked it out, how they were going to do this, what they were going to have to do to actually save our planet, because this is an incredibly dangerous threat that we face. So then around 2000, so the 2008 economic collapse obviously was very destabilizing. 2009, 2010, the deep state players really wanted to take that energy that was already there and collapse society and make things a lot, lot worse than they already were. Of course they do, right? They got a weak economy. The world's in trouble. Hey, let's create a bunch of disasters. Let's make it even worse for everybody, right? Wouldn't that be great? So beginning in two, a lot of things happened in 2010. Pete was telling me about all this crazy stuff where the deep state was trying to create violent events, false flag attacks, this kind of stuff, and I probably shouldn't have said the FF thing out loud, but you know. So they were trying to create these, these deceptive events that look like something else violent is going on when in fact they're responsible for it, but they may even do a self-inflicted wound, right? Like what happened in 2001 in September. It's pretty widely acknowledged now that this is not just a bunch of guys with box cutters that did this. It's, it's way too sophisticated. And they used it for political opportunity, including the fact that almost immediately they come out with this four-inch thick litigation called the Patriot Act, which is essentially copied almost verbatim from German laws in World War II, incidentally. And we, there was research on that way back when. It's basically just the German constitution, the fascist constitution, right? It's ridiculous. So that's what, the, that's what that was. And anyway, in, in 2010, they were trying really hard to collapse everything into World War III, and they could not get it to work. I kept hearing these stories from Pete. Entire underground cities being wiped out, cities that had things that the ETs probably didn't want us to have, threat capability that could have been used to greatly affect life on the surface. So I was hearing about multiple cases of huge underground cities that were wiped out, where there was some kind of vortex in the room 
like a gravitational vortex. And so furniture and people are getting pulled into this vortex. So they would pull out all the people through these vortices, it literally suck them through a portal. After the bases were cleared of personnel, then something happens where the air pressure increases by a thousand fold all at once. And it's like fracking and the entire place just gets fracked and it just goes and, and collapses on itself and there's nothing left. So apparently the Archangel Michael or whoever is doing this is, is portaling massive quantities of gases inside the building so that it just explodes it all at once and then it collapses on itself. So in addition to that, uh, we had many, many other cases of these bizarre angelic interventions going on that seem to stop wars from taking place. So for example, you remember that there was the BP oil spill. Who could forget that in the Gulf of Mexico? Well, they were going to try to do another one in the Middle East, and they meaning the deep state people. So they had these guys with backpacks, and they were going in, and they were going to plant the explosives on the thing, blow it up, and create this huge disaster in the Middle East. And then they're going to, you know, nobody's going to take credit for it, and they're going to blame it on their enemy. Well, when they tried to do this, they found an invisible, there were these seal type of guys, and they found an invisible barrier underwater. They couldn't go over it. They couldn't go under it. And if they tried to go through it, it would stretch like rubber and then push them back. And so for 12 hours, they tried to, to get through this barrier and they could not, and they were never able to plant the explosives. Pete would tell me about that they were gonna do an unprovoked attack of Syria. The tanks wouldn't start, and then they couldn't get the doors on the airplane to open. He told me about two different cases where the Palestinians were gonna invade Israel and the Israelis knew it and anticipated it in advance. They get out on the battlefield, Israel, Israel's ready for their ambush. Both sides come into an actual war, war front and then their guns don't fire and they can't even pull the blades out of the sheaths on their bladed weapons. And two different times this happened, according to Pete, and this is high-level government intel. And in both cases, they fell to the ground and they started crying and, and praising God or Allah, or whoever they were praying to, uh, praising God about the fact that they were not allowed to have this war. They were not allowed to have this fight. So, I mean, every possible thing that you can think of, powering down nuclear submarines, powering down... Uh, ships, powering down planes, powering down tanks, jamming any type of weapon you can imagine. All of this stuff was happening in great proliferation in 2010. I even wrote an article on it called China's October Surprise. Now, China was apparently related to this to some degree, but there's so many of these events that have been happening that we now have to go back to history and look and see that Archangel Michael and others like him are making it impossible for war to be waged unless they authorize it. So they will not allow the deep state to do anything unless it's permitted. So the deep state's tried thousands of times to do all kinds of crazy stuff that they were not allowed to do. And so right now, the deep state is preparing final counterattacks, uh, which you know, stop them, hopefully, they, they hope, stop them from being defeated. But these counterattack moves would require them to be allowed to do it. And I don't think they're going to be allowed to do it. So when the deep state needs it the most, everything they try to do is going to be stopped and blocked. This is what the ETs are telling us. Now, again, I had this whole tearful episode just yesterday feeling like, my God, why do I have to be the one who gets this stuff dropped on me? Why do I have to be the one to do this? Because people don't like prophecy. They get really mad. If it's supernatural and it's really accurate, they go, oh, oh you must be evil. This, this offends me. You know, you, people, this is the work of God. This is not the work of humans. Well, wait, who wrote the Bible? Okay, I'm not saying I'm anything like those guys, but I'm just saying that why do we have to be so hung up on, oh, it's prophecy. Oh, God is talking. It's, it's, we must worship. You know, no, 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 no. It's just that there's so many of us who are still on the blue bus that there's not enough people that were doing the kinds of things that I was doing at the time the beings needed it to be done. So I'm just doing things that, that anybody can do. It's just that I happen to have, you know, been into this for a long time, and I happen to have done remote viewing in 1999, which now is amazingly precise about what's going on in the present. So without further ado, 
and I'm two hours and 19 minutes in here. I know I can make it. We'll try to keep it to three hours. So here we go, back to the slide. So continuing from October 11th is where we left off. And again, they say very funny things that don't make any sense so that my conscious mind can't interpret and analyze the data. That's a very important thing. So sometimes it sounds really strange. Just, just roll with it, okay? He says, stick the money down, stick the money down. Conventional is faster, like war. Conventional war is faster, and money will get war bucks. My wife and I planned a strike together against the massive impositions now in place. Well, whoa, isn't this exactly what's going on right now, folks? Aren't we seeing so many people striking and, and, and husbands and wives striking together? My wife and I planned to strike together against the massive impositions now in place. That didn't make sense before, anywhere near to the degree that it does now. And then when it says, stick the money down, stick the money down, conventional is faster. A stick is like a needle stick, isn't it? And they're making an enormous amount of money on these sticks, aren't they? Stick the money down, and they're talking about war. Stick the money down, right? And they repeat it twice just to make sure that we're really going to pay attention to it. Money will get war bucks. Conventional is faster. What that means is that this method doesn't, doesn't create death as quickly, right? And so now everybody's seeing this as all the other prophecies in preceding days have already been showing us. It, this has to be taken in context, right? They've already definitely proven. They know that this crazy event's going to happen where there's some kind of sickness, where there's some kind of injectable, and where there is uh, an economic collapse associated with this, but that paves the way for the defeat of the deep state. So they're talking about the strike. Indeed, all that will be respected as new and important for change will have quite a dramatic alteration from that which is seen as being important now. And that's starting to happen. There's a dramatic alteration in the way that people see the media, corporations, the pharmaceuticals, everything. <laughs> well, isn't that funny, right? Henry Kissinger wants to have it all to himself, but we have other plans. That's a direct reference to the cabal. That is important. You will see what we mean soon enough. And they know that I'm in the present right now, so they know where we are. A pittance of money. Earthquakes will be seen again to rise. The more that we look at it on the moment-by-moment -moment level, the more that you can see that the predicted changes are already occurring and will greatly accelerate themselves in the coming few months and years. So right here, the pittance of money is talking about the financial collapse, which they've mentioned many times, the increase in earthquakes. We've talked about that. And if you look at it, you can see the predicted changes, which they predicted in 99, are now occurring and will greatly accelerate in the coming few months. Well, a few is usually around three. So, I mean, obviously the posts talk about red October, so we're expecting some big stuff to happen, but a few months is like three. So we got October, November, December. A few would maybe be the end of December, maybe sometime into January. So we might be getting some kind of timeline here about how long these things are all going to take. It's probably likely. So, you know, but, but then they say this. This is still, the, the disaster that you're about to go through or that we are going through is still much less damaging than what had been firmly prophesied before. And that is an important point, one that you need to consider. So in other words, the before, when they're talking about that, it goes into things like the revelation of St. John the Divine, which is the last chapter of the Bible, right? And St. John's revelation is very much talking about earth changes and that kind of disaster. They make it very clear that although older prophecies said this was going to happen, that this new method has, is, is going to produce the appropriate awakening in society with much less damage so we don't have massive areas of land that are completely wiped out. And then this is a direct time loop to where I am right now because I do feel like I'm on vacation and I am in the mountains. So again, they do this over and over again, re referencing my present. A vacationer seeks to take therapy from that which naturally occurs in the mountains. In order that we do not falter with one's inconsistencies on their behalf, we do need to address future situations at the present time through birth. So they are giving birth to information in the present, which is 99, so they can address future situations. In other words, they have the ability to go through time very easily. 
So they're just looking at this as, we want to install information in the future for you. So then they say this, though brief, the wallet includes car keys as well as other moral impediments that can be overcome by simple means. So think about this from a perspective of clean, unfiltered, and detached truth, and you will not be led astray. So the wallet includes car keys as well as other impediments that can be overcome. Well, the wallet would, anytime they talk about money as a, as a dream symbol, it references your spiritual value and the car keys, uh, car keys can be overcome. Well, what I realized, and this is why I made it purple, is that they're talking about getting over, overcoming our insistence on automotive transportation. Car keys can be overcome means we're going to get hover cars next. And they're actually guiding me and helping this whole company and what I'm doing with Ben. We've been very protected, you know, but it also takes a really long time. So it, it's, it's very frustrating to wait. So again, car keys can be overcome. This is a prophecy of hover cars, I believe. The firing of these concerns from their positions, they're talking about the firing of the deep state from all of their political positions, right? Means that, because this is the mass arrest that we're expecting, they know this is going to happen. They predicted it. Once you have turned over your control to the police officer who speaks from England, remember they, they, they referred to the cabal before last week as the policeman's villa? And a villa is an Italian village? Hmm, policeman's villa. These, this, this initiative that came out of that country has become like the policemen of the world, but if the policemen of the world are, are evil, then you got a real big problem, right? So back to the slide. Once you've turned over your control to the police officer who speaks from England, and isn't it interesting actually in the time loop that just now we have in Australia, first they, they, they got rid of the prime minister of New South Wales. I, she's Armenian, I forget her last name, but I know it ends in IAN because they always do. Because I lived in Burbank and it's 90% Armenian town for a whole year. So everybody's very, very excited that, that she got thrown out. But then immediately out comes this military official who says every single person in this country will need to have done this by the end of the year, which is only in three months. And that sounds exactly like what this time loop prophecy is talking about. Once you have turned over your control to the police officer who speaks from England and England controls Australia, right? then you never really have to wait again for another opportunity to be usurped by these forces. And that's kind of like a joke because obviously you don't want to be usurped. So it's not an opportunity. So once you fired these people from their positions, you'll never have to be usurped by them again. That's what this says all at once. Okay. So we do want you to think about the deliberate misnomer that is created when all those around you are capable of creating change, i.e. Des destroying this thing that's ruining our planet for the simple reason that it is much easier to create change than to allow the hypocrisy to continue. This is exactly what's going on right now. And I think these prophecies don't necessarily tell us new information. I think it's more that they just created so much redundancy of these time loops and everything talking about what's going on right now. And again, you got to watch the other weeks. If this is the first time you've seen this, you might be like, I don't know, I don't know. No, you got to go look at all of it and watch the last two videos because it's way, way beyond any type of chance. So it's much easier to create change than to allow the hypocrisy to continue. That sounds very, very current to me. <coughs> In this case, with the, what the deep state is doing right now, and this again sounds just like the present. In this case, the judge, jury, and executioner are one, right? They're doing the whole thing. This must stop, and they are going to make it stop. There needs to be more balance, more egalitarian flow between the various parties and or branches of government, right? So that they don't act like judge, jury, and executioner all at once. There needs to be a better flow. David, you yourself are aware that the idealized version of government of the American country that was taught to you in your social studies class now has very little bearing on the reality of how things are done. It is money that runs politics. Well, you could have probably said that in 99, it would have still sounded good, but it makes even more sense now. Now everybody sees that the idealized American government has nothing to do with what's going on. It's all about money. Therefore, when you stop the flow of capital to those business partners in question, you do then see how it is that the rude processes of governmental control 
are ceased. And this is a very important point. I've heard that people in the Alliance have been working very diligently on collapsing the financial wherewithal of these deep state players and assets. So when they run out of money, they can't really do anything anymore. We already had briefings on this, and then here shows up this reading back to the slide. Once you stop the flow of capital to the cabal, you then see that the rude processes of governmental control will be ceased. So that they're out of money now, and so this is very much in the present. We're, we're, they always tell us in these readings, we talked about it a great deal last week, the big coming economic adjustment, a huge financial collapse, which destroys the old system. And apparently this needs to happen, at least to some degree. Back to the slide. We do understand that the idea of such an economic collapse and systems going boom in the night must seem to be very threatening to you. The entire colonial, meaning the British colonies, right? The entire colonial market structure will have to be rekindled in the face of so much that you now have going away, right? Well, that wouldn't have made sense in 99. But now we're losing all kinds of stuff. We're losing freedom. We're losing our ability to have the things we want. All this stuff. This is particularly partially in reference to the continuing conversation between David and a friend of his, which had its moments yesterday morning. And this is true. I, I did have an argument with my girlfriend at the time, who we call Sabrina in the transcripts. And I was telling Sabrina about these prophecies as they were coming in. And she got very angry. She did not want to believe that the world would ever turn this bad. And I said, well... This is what they're saying. They're saying there's going to be a huge economic collapse. They're saying, eh. So we had this argument, and then they commented on our argument after we had the argument. So the entire colonial market structure will have to be rekindled. Now, a colonial market structure, maybe they're talking more about the 13 colonies, right? They're talking about barter. They're talking about, you know, the colonies printed their own money. They didn't use British pounds. The entire colonial market structure will have to be rekindled. So we're going to need to do more trade and we may, you know, change our currency. So then they, he says, regardless of where I was, there were always the entities or souls who continued to get over on me in the directly physical sense. There are changes which I have sought to implement for a long period of time. And this does not fundamentally alter the essential nature of the work that has been done. It just means that the proper situations had to be made manifest in order that these circumstances be brought about. So Archangel Michael is saying that there's always people trying to get over on humanity in the directly physical sense, the first line there, right? So this is what's happening now. They're trying to get over on us on a global level. In order to stop this, he had these changes he wants to, wanted to implement for a long period of time, but it required the proper situations to be made manifest, which is what we're seeing now with the economy and everything else. And so, Michael says, when you look at this through the objective lens of true reality, as opposed to needless hardship, you can indeed see what we are doing. This is, they're not letting this happen for needless hardship. We are working very actively to preserve your planet in order that your own self-defeating materialistic corporate structures do not completely destroy what you have. Well, that wouldn't have made sense in 99, but it sure makes sense now. Absolutely. You are now realizing that the processes of environmental devastation are so rapidly advancing that it will indeed drive you to extinction yourselves if you were not to have outside help. And thus a valiant service is being provided to you by higher forces like Michael aiding in the process of saving Earth. We understand and acknowledge that as you, the reader of these words, pause to internalize these messages, you may feel that the pen with which we write is more like a syringe that will pierce the skin and cause extreme pain even as the necessary medicine is going in. Hmm. A syringe doesn't normally cause extreme pain, does it? It's, it hurts a little bit, but not that much. And then this idea of necessary medicine. I mean, holy crap, folks. They keep da dancing around it, talking around it, but they're, they're right on the nose here, right? Because the extreme pain is not the normal thing. It's what happens afterwards. And then necessary medicine. And remember, they referred to it before as the, the FDA's so-called chemical nutrients, right? So necessary meaning mandated. It's not really, it's not really necessary. So... Uh, you may feel that the pen with which we write is more like a syringe that causes extreme pain as it pierces the skin, even as necessary medicine goes in. 
Wow. I mean, they know what's going to happen, folks. It's very obvious. What we want you to see is a different angle. And let us use this as our example. The vast, vast majority of entities on your plane are simply not capable of dealing with the truth. They are not capable of dealing with the truth. And isn't that what we're seeing right now? Isn't that the whole test that's going on right now is, are you, are you able to even allow yourself to believe the possibility that enough people could have organized together like this that they would actually pursue this agenda? And yet, wait a minute, how long have they been telling us, go back to the movie The Matrix, right? It's always the villains that deliver the, the key line. Didn't Agent Smith in The Matrix say humans are a virus? And what do you do with a virus? You're supposed to kill the virus, right? They've, they, in other words, they use the villains in a lot of these movies, like Batman Begins, another great example, right? Over and over again. The villain expresses their philosophy. The villain has to be defeated in the movie, but they still get the philosophy out. They still tell you, yeah, we got too many people and it's a big problem. We got to get rid of them. And they keep saying this in Hollywood over and over again. Hollywood now is looking very, very evil to me. I mean, honestly, the way this is all kind of... I'm, I'm so happy that I never got a, a showbiz deal because I was seeking a showbiz deal, and I'm really, really glad that I didn't. But what I was told was everybody knows who I am and nobody wants to give David Wilcock a job. <laughs> I can understand why, because I'm exposing them. Why would they want to give me a job to help me better expose them? Okay, so the vast majority of, the of people on earth cannot deal with the truth. They cannot process that people are doing this. Well, the higher beings in 1999 laid the whole thing out for us. And part of us all growing up out of spiritual childhood is, is learning to understand that, yes, there's evil people in the world and they are trying to kill us. It's a basic part of getting through that level of your awakening before you get to deeper levels that could go beyond that. Back to the slide. David, David discovered this yesterday in a very spherical way, that the resistance to these prophecies, by having his discussion with Sabrina about this topic. The simple fact of the matter is that to the vast majority of entities upon your plane, the idea of environmental destruction and sociological collapse is so profound and all-encompassing that they literally cannot allow themselves to think about it. This is, we're seeing this everywhere right now, right? Sociological collapse, of course, we know what that is now. They have to relegate it, and they're telling us, right, with the, the, they just mentioned injections a couple lines back. They cannot allow themselves to think about it. They have to relegate it to some dark corner of the mind in order to overcome its influences. Now, on the other hand, you have to envision what it is like for us in the higher realms. We can work on both sides of the fence, seeing things from your perspective, as well as working on a level that you do not now understand. We must recognize that when you are talking about problems such as these, which again, they've described, they know exactly what we're going through right now. You are talking about a situation where there are those who work on the spiritual levels, so to speak, who must aid and assist you in any way possible. In short, we are your guardians and our mission and purpose is to make sure that no matter what you do, you will be protected on the grander scheme of things. Your current economic, political, and corporate structures are so inherently self-serving and backwards that drastic changes are indeed necessary to occur. And that's much more visible now than it was in 99 when they said this. It is similar to a school teacher looking at a student's recent final exam paper and declaring a failing grade with an opportunity for a retake. The student must then retreat from school to his house where he can then study the information in greater detail until a deeper level of knowledge is then retained. At this time, he may go back and try the final exam again, hoping to score more appropriately. Ideally, what we want is for these changes to become as painless for you as possible. However, we know that the realities are different, so they don't want us to hurt as we go through this. We do understand and are not denying the fact that this series of events, which we're going through now, will cause extreme economic hardship for some, and remember in previous dreams they basically said it was everybody, and extreme opportunity for others also in a negative sense, right? Because certain entities, certain deep state entities are profiting right now very much. So extreme economic hardship for some, extreme profit for others in a negative sense. 
what we do want you to be aware of is that there are more people on the planet than Americans. Isn't that funny? They say really funny stuff sometimes. <laughs> Americans do think that way, don't they? It's really funny. And we are not speaking to those in foreign countries now, but to those in America who represent the vast majority of our readership and viewership at this time. You need to become aware of the fact that these changes will affect you and they will affect your working poor most dramatically. And they rarely say need or must. So they will affect your working poor most dramatically. That's totally time loop to the present, right? It's exactly what we're seeing. However, there is an entire continent, namely that of Africa, where there are people starving and dying from AIDS-related illnesses in massive numbers. You are not somehow exclusive from the rest of the world in this manner. Well, I got to be really careful about how I interpret this prophecy because it should be very widely known if you've been looking at this by now. Many, many geneticists have talked about the idea that whatever was released in, in 19 seems to have been genetically engineered out of using this particular molecule that they just mentioned with the four letters, right? Using that molecule as the base and then changing some of the spikes on it. But essentially, it's got that as its base. And that's not anything unusual. I mean, if, if you've been doing all the homework on this, you've undoubtedly encountered this data already. So then when they say there's an entire continent where people are starving and dying from AIDS-related illnesses, you are not somehow exclusive from the West of the world in this manner. Does that mean that AIDS is going to go all over the world? No. They said AIDS-related illnesses. Illnesses. You are not somehow exclusive from the rest of the world. Whoa. That's, that's very, very accurate. You know, everything is accurate. They talked about injections, all this stuff. We are not saber-rattling here, meaning they don't want to make a war with the deep state. Merely wanting you to think about these issues from the perspective of clean, unfiltered truth. The discord that is being sown on the planet right now is far worse in those countries affected by the American-based multinational corporate structure than you could even imagine. Right, so the, the closer you are to the cabal, which is again American influence, America was the military arm of the cabal, it has the city of London, which is a financial center, the Vatican City, which is the spiritual center, and Washington, D.C. is the uh, military center. And each of these are city-states within a nation that have their own government, their own rules, and a giant obelisk, okay? All three of them do that. So it's the American-based multinational corporate structure that's sowing the discord in the planet right now. And sure enough, all of this stuff seems to be coming out of America, right? The, the, the way the election went, they're kind of leading the way on some of the things they say about what's going to happen. Oh, we developed this thing. Okay. It is the third world countries who are being bought and sold like poker chips that are paying the highest price and whose people are starving and living in desperate conditions. We do understand that the economic changes we speak of will cause many great problems, but many great problems exist now, and this is the majority of people whom we are speaking about. One argument that was raised in David's recent conversation was that the person enjoyed the conveniences of modern society and did not want to see them taken away, that life would become a rather dull and boring place if it were not for all these wonderful niceties you now have. The idea of losing the junk food supply seemed too overwhelming at that time. And that is funny because Sabrina actually did say she didn't want to lose the junk food supply. And I laughed and laughed. And so they actually referenced it in the reading. On that topic, we have a few words to say as well. Uh-oh, now they're going to nag you about your diet again, probably. I don't know. Let's see. The most important thing we can do is to sow the seeds of change in yourself and in the world, right? Your frequency increase must be navigated through, and this demands your vigilance and respect. You do need to be very aware on the deepest possible levels of your being that we are not at all kidding you when we say that 75,000 or more years of your time, i.e. 325,000 year cycles, are reaching their point of completion. Indeed, the three major cycles with which humanity has had time to explore materiality in the third dimension are very, very rapidly approaching their close. It is at this time that if anything is to happen, it must happen, meaning now. It is this time, which we're in right now, which is more important than any other. Wow. We know that you have difficulty understanding how a subconsciously held agenda 
can seem to be more important than a consciously held one. So again, this time is more important than any other. If anything's going to happen, it has to happen at this time. So this is the military's actions, whatever, it's got to happen now. This is the most important time in human history. That's what they're telling us. So we know you have difficulty understanding that a subconsciously held agenda could be more important than a consciously held one. However, you must also keep firmly in mind the idea that the changes we speak of, which we're going through now, are the most gentle and the most glorious chiropractic adjustments that we can make to help you through this period of transformation without major incidents, right? Because there's, a, there's actually a, law, a lack of severe loss of property and land. It's not like a big tidal wave, earthquake, volcano, tsunami, nothing like that. But then what do they say about it? Look at this. Not only are these the most gentle and glorious chiropractic adjustments that could be made without major incidents, this series of events will force people to work together in a way that has not been done since the Great Depression. And I think we're already seeing this now. It's, it's stunning. And, and all this stuff coming through in 1999, right? Back to the slide. It will bring about and foster a new sense of community living and a new understanding of how people can interrelate with each other on a directly local level, instead of the much more federalized and internationalized forms of government that are now seen. Well, this is another amazing prophecy, right? Because directly local could refer to state governments, and it's totally the new understanding of the state governments pushing back against the DS. That's exactly what we're seeing in America right now, and many other places too. Uh, Local inter interaction. General Flynn's always talking about this. You got to get involved. You got to get into your local communities, run for office, you know, speak up about what's going on. Don't wait for somebody else to do this. Well, this is exactly so. Archangel Michael is saying the same thing that Michael Flynn is saying in the physical. And I think that's because, again, there's a vibrational affinity. I'm not the only one that's working with Michael here. Uh, I think the whole alliance is actually Michael's agenda, if you really get right down to it. So a new understanding of how people can relate with each other on a directly local level instead of the much more federalized, internationalized forms of government. And they already talked about the oppression that they're putting us under, right? Take a moment to reflect on these concerns and recognize the degree of power that we do have to cessate those concerns that plague your world at this time. They can stop anything if they want to. They can... We talked about this, right? They stop Bombay doors from opening on a plane, stop tanks from starting, stop gun, machine guns from firing, stop missiles from working, stop knives from being able to unsheath. They can do anything they want. So it says again, recognize the degree of power that we do have to stop anything that's plaguing your world at this time. Do not ever forget that we have the capabilities to produce this utopian realm of majesty on your planet for you. Or even more importantly, you have the ability to produce this. We are merely the catalysts for your own change. Well, what's better for a utopian realm of majesty on Earth than anti-gravity and free energy? And so it's kind of ironic, isn't it, that by you joining the disclosure, by you signing up for this course and, and, and doing the initiation of paying the money, because it is a financial commitment, right? Not only is your money going back to this initiative that could get us out into outer space and, and see the ruins on other worlds, it's all part of us taking back our own power. We're not asking extraterrestrials to come here and build UFOs for us. They're teaching us how to do it ourselves. And they're giving us the means to get this out there because it's an infringement on our free will for them to actually show up. Obviously, they would prefer to start out with something like this where they're talking and people still may not believe it, but then later on, when they really show up, there's going to be no doubt that this is what's going on. So we have the ability to produce this. Back to the slide. You will be able to find yourselves walking and interacting in a world that is so much different and so much more enlightened than the one which you are now in that it would literally boggle your mind to conceive of it. Isn't that amazing? If everybody is nice to each other and negativity has been rooted out and we have all this amazing new technology and we're interacting with extraterrestrials and then we become telepathic and then we find out that we can fly, wow, it would literally boggle your mind. That's what they're saying right here. Okay, let's hit it again. Since we don't want to bore or upset you, we won't continue this particular reading much longer. Well, 
actually we're running out of time for the show too. <laughs> the point we wish to express is the fact that you do need to realize that a great deal of objective thought and subjective analysis has gone into this current design, meaning they're authorizing this thing to go down the way it's going down, and they've done a great deal of objective thought and subjective analysis. It is obviously much less severe than the repertoire that could have been used earlier with regards to land subsidence and the like. This is talking about pole shift, right? Huge, huge earthquakes, catastrophes. We will be working on a variety of levels to ensure that as little chaos as possible is created. So they're not going to allow big earth changes to occur. They're not going to allow big disasters to occur. They're not going to allow nuclear exchange. Everybody's pretty familiar with the fact that ETs don't allow nuclear exchange to occur. But on the other hand, um, they're also doing all this other stuff. This, the briefings I've gotten, there's no limit to what they can do to stop any jet or tank or missile or you name it from working. So it says right here, again, they'll be working on a variety of levels to ensure that as little chaos as possible is created. And they do this in a way that you don't even see. So they have plausible deniability. It's not an extraterrestrial or angelic intervention. It's just what happened, you know? We cannot guarantee that those weakest elements of American society in terms of financial income will not be adversely affected, of course. But the more important point is that those who have such great levels of material wealth in the here and now will be forced to make adaptations that are far more serious in their own terms. So even though people on earth are going to be broke as a joke and too poor to have two pennies to rub together, you being broke as a joke apparently is still a lot less of an adjustment <laughs> than the deep state folks losing all of their wealth because they have an, the private jets. I mean, just all the, just incredible. And the power, really. It's not so much about the stuff. It's about how you use money to create totalitarianism, right? So they will have a far more serious loss than the weakest elements of American society in terms of financial income. And that's important. Back to the slide. There will be a great deal of humility in this new world as all will learn to understand that their actions need to be reconsidered as if they are of an appropriate nature for the continued survival of the human species. Well, humility is good, and I think we're starting to see this happen now. It's going to get a lot more. We do understand this can trigger a defensive reaction and lead to confrontations about the validity of this source and its information. We also want you to see that on the subconscious level, all of you are desperately praying for any possible solution to change what is going on. And for many of you, it is also on the directly conscious level as well. See this as what we're in now, today, right? Because they've given us the time loop. See this as an important turning point. Your social structures cannot continue as they are now. You may like them as they are, but you cannot like the idea of a planet that is dead. That is the bottom line. These changes have to happen if any of you were to survive. So this is kind of a tragic and almost, you know, humorous thing. Like, wow, if we didn't have this crazy thing happen with the, the virus and then the, the injections and, and, and the economic stuff and, and all the political and social political turmoil, if we hadn't have gone through this, we would have lost the earth. These higher beings are literally telling us that if they hadn't to run us through this, the planet would have died. So this was the only way that this could have happened. It's really intense. If we did not do this for you, then you would indeed believe that God was dead and did not care about you when the resulting effects of your continued materialistic structures reap their harvest. The harvest that we sow is one of positive social change and transformation into the fourth density. We want you to understand this so that you do not slip or slide, but merely remain focused on the goal. Seek within yourself to end the apocalypses that you have created in your own life. Seek to overcome self-indulgent habit patterns and destructive ego-centered behaviors. Seek to strive ever forward for the promises of a new tomorrow, now made today by their simple manifestations into physical view. Like this hover car, right? I mean, I'm showing you something that was drawn in 1987. It's built to use gravitational propulsion. It really works. Here's the front view. Here's the side view. Imagine, 
you know, tooling along in these. And as I said, the wings fold down and it uses partial lift propulsion. Well, we're, we're going to be talking all about this in the disclosure and really getting you excited about the future that's coming because this is real. So a few more of these and then we're, we're three hours, almost three hours now. So I'm going to try to wrap this up pretty quick. Know and understand that in our heart of hearts, we only want the best for you. We are prepared to do everything within our power to see to it that your social changes occur as painlessly as possible. Everything within their power. And their power is incredible. They have the power to stop nukes from being launched. They have the power to stop any, any machine from working. They can do incredible stuff. So again, what they're saying is, yes, it's supposed to be scary, but no, it's not bad. It's actually going to lead to something very, very good. And if they've been right about everything else up until now, why would this prophecy be wrong, right? And they even said in the last week's show, right, if even 10% of the people watching this or encountering this information as I put it out, if even 10% of us can feel genuinely positive and happy about what's going on and see that freedom is coming and it's going to all work out, trust the plan, right? Even 10% and the whole thing is going to go much more smoothly. So then look at this. Those who need to experience great collapse of their overinflated wealth will have that opportunity, and it's happening now. Those others on the lower end of the income spectrum will certainly endure periods of hardship, but the American economy is one of great bounty, and it has enormous potentials to restructure in order to provide its people with the basic necessities for life, such as food, shelter, and water. So all the things that, that they're trying to do right now to knock us down and to destroy our society, it gets back into chaos theory, right? Chaos theory basically is showing us that like nonlinear things happen all the time in which order is created out of chaos by some universal intelligence, if you will. And so in the in, in specifically in complexity theory, what they what they've done is they've studied a, a sand pile, which is a complex system in this in this complexity model. You can model a sand pile in a computer and you can monitor where every particle of sand is and how much pressure it has on it and which direction it wants to go next. You can do this on a supercomputer level where every single particle is being analyzed. Now, as the sand pile rises, as more sand is piled upon it, eventually it reaches chaos, which is the peak instability. The moment where there is going to be some kind of a collapse in the form of an avalanche. In the computer model, what they discovered is you cannot predict the outcome of the avalanche ahead of time. You cannot predict anything except that the sand pile now restructures into a higher and more organized level. And another thing that's really fascinating by the supercomputer stuff is that a single particle of sand could become the particle upon which the entire new structure of the sand pile organizes around. One particle could be the agent of change for the entire system. And that's very, very amazing. So when we study advanced physics, what we see is that nature has an organizing principle, not a chaos principle. So they're talking about that right here. No matter how badly the deep state tries to destroy America and the world, this, this complexity theory, this self-organizing complexity always will occur. There's humans in the system and they will make sure that the food that we grow gets to the tables. So th they're never going to be able to make people starve. It's, it, they, they think they can, but that's not going to happen. They say it right here. American economy is one of great bounty and has enormous potentials to restructure so that we have food, shelter, and water. And thus it is not as bad as you might think. Many of the other countries in the world are already much more capable of handling the loss of technology. Well, we wouldn't know why they would be losing it in 99. Now we do, right? It's all part of this shutdown thing. As there are more traditional structures still in place that will help them. Yours is a different story, but one that is equally potential of a healing in the end. We do want to remind you that you are loved more than you could ever possibly imagine. Do not lose sight of the big picture when you can only focus upon the immediate negatives of situations that must be created. Thank you and peace be with you in the light of everlasting love. We now end this reading, Adonai. And now there was a little bit more on the 12th. I think there's some more slides. So I'm just going to keep going. The scientific leaders say that the entire affair must be postponed for as long as possible. Hmm. Hmm. 
In other words, the cosmic necessities of future life-making and love-making all revolve around the fundamental aspects of trust. A thin outbreak of sorts awaits you in the physical plane as a result of the circumstances now occurring. An outbreak of sorts awaits you in the physical plane as a result of the circumstances now occurring. Well, an outbreak is, is viral, right? But then it says a thin outbreak, which means maybe it's not really as dangerous as everybody says it is, huh? How did they get this in 1999? And then it says the scientific leaders say the entire affair be postponed for as long as possible. This, I believe, is the reopening of society. And they say trust the science, right? The scientific leaders. Well, they're not really leaders and it's not really science. So they want to postpone the reopening for as long as possible. And then they say, in other words, future life-making, love-making revolves around trust. And trust has been completely destroyed because we can't get back to love-making and life-making if, if we're all locked down, right? You can't go find people to be in a relationship with if you can't meet anybody. And so there it is. This, this actually has a lot in it. The scientific leaders say the lockdown must be postponed as long as possible. And this has destroyed everybody's trust based on this outbreak that, that happens in the physical plane. Hmm. We want you to become more and more aware of the possible potential for angst amongst themselves. This is the deep state, right? That they're not, this is not working out the way they wanted it to. And in so doing, you can then take the appropriate steps to try to ensure that that does not happen, meaning stop them from doing what they want to do. So they have angst amongst themselves. Where there is smoke, there is fire. And in the loose canon of desires unmaintained, there is the potential for such a disaster. Just keep these facts in mind. We don't want any of these probability vortices to have any likelihood of manifestation. That's all. So, uh, you know, they say where the, the loose canon of desires unmaintained, um, there is the potential for such a disaster, meaning this global control. Well, this is already happening. We are speaking of some issues that will rise to the surface when you aim your potential at nothing more than the least superfluous opportunities that present themselves in each and every moment. The Globe newspaper certainly had some wild and wacky stories. Well, they're talking about mainstream media in general, right? And all the stories that are coming out now. But yet it does serve people or entities upon your plane just by its sense for the bizarre. Similarly, you have all the tools within you to create a wild and wonderful life story that reads like fiction, but it believes like nonfiction as it is the truth. We all have this potential. Do you have any flavor that we might be able to use? Indeed, I do. It is that divine aroma of the Father, Mother, God, or the one infinite creator and its various concatenations. Well, apparently Father, Mother, God does not have body odor, right? Because <laughs> it's a divine aroma. So I think they're talking more about like terpenes, like incense, some stuff that smells really good, not, not body odor. That's funny though. While we continue defaming the entire matter on many levels in your civilization, because they are actually defaming the deep state, right? They're, they're lobbing bombs here. This is, this is, it is in one sense a form of defamation, which is really hilarious. Back to the slide. While we still continue defaming the entire matter on many levels in your civilization, we find that in the future, many more of those will reenact their diversity to take upon themselves a new set of beliefs that may have felt foreign or alien at one time, but are now starting to make sense. And that is a good thing. And isn't it interesting, right, that all of the deep state strategies right now are based on driving home, you know, the lack of diversity, you know, racism and, and all this stuff that's like divide and conquer. And so now, so many people, as it says right here, back to the slide, as a result of what we're seeing in the earth right now, we have to take on a new set of beliefs that might have felt foreign or alien, but now makes sense. In other words, everybody's learning what's really going on with the deep state. When we fly our own stars and stripes, a banner of sorts is formed. And this is another time loop because just now AOC is introducing legislation to try to change the American flag. So another time loop. Back to the slide. When we fly our own stars and stripes, a banner of sorts is formed. We do find that those in Nashville, Tennessee, or Amarillo, Texas, have ever more increasing opportunities to be of service to others in their own local area. You can look for this in the months ahead. And I think, again, this is talking about 
stepping up with the audit and all that kind of stuff. It's very obviously something like that. Flying your own stars and stripes, reclaiming America. That's what they're talking about. We don't want to appear overly facetious in any sense, but the entire train is indeed boarding for its final call at this time. It is important that you make amends with those who have wronged you in the past and allow yourself to forgive them. This forgiveness is also mercy, as when you release your energetic charge on them, you are also freeing them from the encumbering effect of your vibrations when negatively focused. And so this is a higher path of learning and wisdom. It is indeed prudent and viable for you to go through, systematically speaking, of course, your life and discover all those whom you have felt hurt or wronged by and forgive them and accept them with love. You must also forgive and accept yourself with love as well. So I, I've been letting them go for a long, yeah, I've been letting them go for a long time on this one, but this is, this is a big, big point. The only thing they really, really want us to be doing here is clearing old past life and current trauma and, uh, and forgiving and accepting ourselves and others. That's, that's the whole lesson. So like, you may want to be going through your life right now and think about situations that have really kind of scarred you when you were younger and that they defined your personality and, and your behavior in certain ways. Now all those things are coming up for review. So now is a great time to call up people who you haven't usually been talking to on the phone, family members, friends, etc., to apologize for things that you may have done in the past that hurt someone else, and to make amends wherever possible, because this is an action that is like cloud computing. When, when we do this on the personal level, we are directly contributing to the defeat of the deep state because, again, it's only when enough people do this that all the energy shifts. So, again, if you want to contribute directly to the transformation of planet Earth, one of the best ways you can do this is by forgiving the people who hurt you the most and also forgiving yourself. They mention this over and over again. In forgiveness is the stopping of the wheel of karma. It's the most important teaching we have. Everything else comes off of that. Back to the slide. The background emotional suffering and sorrow that you feel is not intended to provide lung cancer at any minute. Rather, it is done for your own edification so that you can have a much greater ability to respect yourself and others around you in the times ahead. And again, the intended to provide lung cancer at any minute thing is strange because it may be relevant that when COVID first showed up, of course, everybody gets this upper respiratory problem. So lung problems are a big, big part of this. So they're talking about emotional suffering and sorrow not intended to provide lung cancer at any minute. And then it is much greater ability to respect yourself in the times ahead. So this is another message, I think, about that, but it's a little bit veiled. Back to the slide. A new crop circle is forming in the growing wheat of your own harvest. You can choose to look at these geometric patterns from above, analyze their haze and their formation, and see if the resulting pictogram has any meaning for you. And this is, of course, all metaphorical. You will often find that the entire affair is not cemented in like you might think it is, but is still open to a massive degree of changes. So in other words, even now, there's no absolute way that this whole thing's going to go. You can still be open to a massive degree of changes over what might be happening now. Back to the slide. We want you to know that when the woman comes, and they're talking about an angelic ET, they explain this later. This is ascension, when they come to pick you up, you know, before the earth has its pole shift, you get to go on a mothership ride and you never have to experience any disaster. That's what they've said over and over again. We want you to know that when the woman comes, you will have all the chances you need to break the concrete cast of the physical realm and to go up with her. This is in reference to the angelic visitations that you can expect when the moment itself, the tr quantum quickening, happens and we turn into this new form. We do indeed admire and respect the fact that so many of you are working as diligently as possible to be of service and want to know whatever you can do to do this to a more and more refined and higher degree. Just as the Brazilian economy must go through its contortions in the 1990s as this was done, it had a horrible, horrible financial collapse, right? American society must go through its contortions as well. And this is what's happening now. We don't want to appear overly steep when we speak about these things, and yet we know that your entry into the higher realms is predicated 
upon the releasing of many potential vibrations in your planetary sphere. And so the releasing of many potential vibrations is, is negative vibrations. They want us to, to get rid of the negative on Earth, which is what we're doing. And so, in another sense, as we go through this ongoing series about the changes that are happening to you, we can say that the new astronomers will understand the connection between science and metaphysics in a way that they now cannot. They will realize, indeed, that the global energetic grid is a factor, as it does shape the structures of continents and land. I've talked about this extensively, and it was in the last class, Gateway to Galactic Mind. They will recognize that this energy is composed of higher dimensional vibrations and the human beings upon the grid are also the co-creators of it. So we have a direct effect on, you know, tornadoes, volcanoes, tsunamis, everything, hurricanes, you name it. It's, it's our energy that affects the grid. Back to the slide. And therefore, whenever you see human negativity or seeds of discord, you have a potential crimping effect on the grid in that particular area. We will once again remind you that it is the concerted effort of those in the California area that has prevented them from sinking from the San Andreas Fault, right? Or otherwise experiencing cataclysmic earth changes. The void is pure when you can find it within yourself. It's a beautiful line. If you are capable of refining your cleansing processes to the point where these things can happen, then you allow yourself the trust that is necessary to open up into higher intelligence. So when they say these things can happen, they're talking about meditation. So when you meditate, you find a pure void within yourself, and this allows you the trust to open up to higher intelligence. We don't want to overly bully you over with the same message again and again, but you should be aware that the machine shop will be able to fix your vehicle of ascension. It is indeed prudent for you to work more and more diligently at cutting the ties to the physical world and all those karmic obligations that you might have incurred as you go along. Now, here's the other thing, interestingly, about the machine shop will be able to fix your vehicle, okay? Right now, uh, one of the first things that my company is going to be doing is, is the MiG-29 upgrade project. There's about 4,000 MiG-29s all over the world, and they're all sitting there doing nothing, not defending anybody, not keeping people safe. There's no parts for them. The Russians don't service them. So they're like almost garbage. Well, what we're going to be doing is a MiG-29 upgrade, where we take modern American parts from American manufacturers, we get new avionics, new radar, new, new wheels, new brakes. Uh, it's, it's a NATO compatible. So what we're doing is we have a machine shop where we're gonna be doing this work. And, and so right now, we are waiting on money coming in as soon as we get the money, which is supposed to be Monday or Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday we're immediately going to do a MiG-29 upgrade and then bring it up to our facility. And we're going to be working with machine shops a lot. So the machine shop will be able to fix your vehicle has two meanings because we intend to, you know, create a very, very low cost option where for 10 or $15 million, you can upgrade your MiGs and you can have NATO compatible modern aircraft. Instead of having to pay for something new, why don't we use what you already have? Well, we've had a tremendous amount of interest on this. And again, I'm not going to say who our customers are now. Maybe in the future we will, but... That's another really, really weird time loop because the, 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 also the facility that we literally just acquired that we're probably about to finish paying for here, um, it's got several machine shops in it. So like, and I'm, I'm very familiar with machine shops now as a result of all the work I've been doing. So when the words machine shop pop up, I'm like, whoa, the machine shop will be able to fix your vehicle. I mean... Monday or Tuesday, Ben is going to go down and fix this MIG as soon as we get the money. So the time loop's incredible. It's incredible. I mean, you might not want to believe this. You might not be ready to take all this in yet. You might not be ready to be like, holy crap, this is all real. But I've already gotten there. I'm, I'm just blown away by this. Let's go back to the slide now. So the machine shop will be able to fix your vehicle of ascension, direct reference to our MIG upgrade program. And therefore, it is prudent to go back and look at those issues you have struggled with, even those that are the most horribly painful and invasive. This is their message over and over again. Look at the darkest, nastiest, most horrible stuff. A lot of people have been physically violated sexually. It's sad, but it's true, right? Well, I've gotten to see from people I got to know firsthand that child sexual abuse can really, really damage a person for life. I've I had some clients who had that too. 
And so I know that some people are able to get through this with therapy, counseling, and so on, whereas other people really suffer. So uh, you can't really change the bad things that happen to you. I've had some very, very, thankfully I wasn't molested or abused or raped, but like many, many other things have happened to me that were extremely intense. And you have to go through and find those things. And, and the first step is acceptance. You have to accept that it happened. Forgiveness comes later, but a lot of times in the law of one, they say acceptance and forgiveness, right? So the first step is acceptance. To be able to say, yes, these painful things happened to me, and yes, I'm still here, and yes, I'm still going. That's, that's very powerful. That is the ultimate point of David's dream, and how, which I didn't include because I just wanted to get to Michael, uh, and how it will infiltrate into many other people's lives who might read these works. So my dream was all about like this weird... It was like a sex spiritual cult, actually. And uh, I have been very, very careful to not get involved sexually with, with fans and, and womanizing and all that kind of stuff. But again, only after being very, very thoroughly warned by these beings that like if I screw around on somebody and betray monogamy, I'm dead. It's not even like, well, yeah, we, we won't like it. It's like, no, we, we will not be able to protect you if you start... In engaging in sexual actions with people where they think it's going to go somewhere and then you're just womanizing and, and you don't think it's going anywhere. I cannot do that. And they've made it very clear to me over and over again because this is the downfall of so many spiritual leaders. Because I'll tell you what, you know, if you go out there and you make a name for yourself and you get in front of audiences, most of the women there want to seduce you if you meet them at the end. And, and, and it's so easy for men to take advantage of that and to use that opportunity, quote unquote. It became very obvious to me that I could, I could just rack them up. I mean, but I don't want to do that. It's, it's ridiculous. Like the law of one talks about sex addiction as this thing where your heart chakra hasn't been healed. And so if your green ray chakra is really like damaged, then you might think that sexuality is going to get you the love that you're really seeking, but it doesn't. In fact, people who are sex addicts they talk about this in the Law of One. They say they never really get what they're looking for. They never find someone to stay with because the real issue is the healing that needs to happen in their heart. And until you heal your broken heart, you can't really share it with someone else, right? If your heart is broken, you can't give it away. So we all need to do this work to heal ourselves because if you haven't healed your broken heart, if somebody really hurt you, you might go around having sex with other people, and essentially persecuting your projection. You're attacking somebody else for what the original person did to you. And that really sucks because, yes, it's easy to find somebody else who reminds you of the person who traumatized you in the first place. But just because they remind you of the person who traumatized you, that doesn't mean that you should go after them. How does racism usually get started? Racism usually gets started because somebody has bad experiences with certain members of a race and then they start to make these projections and they generalize, right? So if you want to get over racism, you got to heal whatever happened to you where a particular person of that nationality upset you and now you get triggered by them, you know? So it's really, really important, as they said, back to the slide, to go back and look at the issues, even the most horribly painful and invasive issues. Now, if more of us were able to do this, there would have never been a deep state in the first place. I've dealt with codependent relationships my whole life, unfortunately. I've dealt with psychopaths, narcissists, abusers, manipulators my entire life. I was bullied as a child. I was shot 30 feet off of a cliff and landed on my snow saucer, shattering the saucer, which actually created incredible damage to the muscle and the fascia in my right leg, which I'm now finally, after the last two, three years, I've been clearing this up and I'm finally almost done getting the full range of motion back in my hip without pain, but it's been an incredible process. It's because these kids threw me off Monkey Hill on my snow saucer and it shattered and damaged my leg greatly, right? So uh, it's, it's been horribly painful to go through this, this hip healing stuff because you got to push through all the the, the, the fascia is the tissue around the muscle and the muscle fibers get stuck to the fascia in funny ways, which create knots. So there's no blood flow in the muscle. So now I'm getting like the ability to really use my leg properly. And it's, it's amazing to walk without pain, but you have to push through the pain. Okay, back to the slide. 
The corner store will hear the slingshot that is being pulled back as a louder noise than many others. And this is talking about how mom and pop businesses are going to get uh, more affected by this change than anybody else. But the slingshot indicates uh, being spring-loaded and going into some new ascension thing, right? We do want to indicate that this entire system collapse that we are engendering. In other words, they're allowing it to happen. They're steering it to make sure it happens because they have to collapse the old ways of doing things. This entire system collapse we are engendering does include many others who are on a middle-of-the-road place in the spectrum, right? So everybody on the middle of the road has to be brought over to see what's going on. When your entire survival as a species is at stake, there are indeed going to be many difficult moral questions that arise as to the rightness of such an action. In other words, they understand that there's going to be morality concerns over, you know, was it the right thing for positive angelic beings to allow this to happen or not? Well, they say, yeah, it's a difficult question, but your entire species' survival is at stake. Okay. Then they say, whoops, small business owners and homeowners will be affected somewhat dramatically, but yet it is a dramatic event for all who experience it. Well, isn't this interesting? They focused on small business owners and homeowners. Well, small businesses are, are in terrifying, let's back to the camera. Small businesses are in terrifying collapse right now. And homeowners have been greatly affected because home prices have gone through the roof. In other words, you can sell your house and you can make a lot of money or people are buying houses and they're throwing way too much money in. So like, yeah, homeowners will be affected somewhat dramatically, but yet all who experience it will be seeing it as dramatic. So everybody's got to go through this. We are very, back to the slide, we are very glad to have to tell you this as we know that it allows you to vector in on events that will be occurring in order that you can remain perfectly joyful and content in the midst of it. Once again, they keep saying that it's all going to be fine. You will recognize and be aware of the fact that the prophecies as we have given them are coming true. Well, we already are. Even if this website or this material is no longer directly available to you at that point, right? Because the internet might go down, so you wouldn't be able to watch this video again. You will continue to be able to know what it was that you were told and how best to navigate through these changes. That's not in the least bit terrifying. <laughs> They're both laughing over there. <laughs> I like it when you laugh at my jokes. Thank you. For right now, we change the oil on your car, symbolically speaking, of course, and prepare for a nice long drive. Yes, it's another time loop because right now I'm in the process of changing the battery on my car and I'm going to change, I have to change the oil as well and I'm preparing for a nice long drive back to Arizona. So they knew that. It's unbelievable. I'm telling you, this whole thing freaks me out. But I'm just doing my job reading this stuff. In the aquamarine colors that are flying into the matrix at this time, I guess that's like fourth density and higher energies coming in, we have the capacity to do so much more without needing the extreme examples that were once required, right? With the volcanoes and the earthquakes. In other words, that's not going to be happening. That's, it's not the biblical book of Revelation apocalypse. This is what we're getting instead. You all are systematically becoming more and more capable of creating massive and spontaneous changes within yourselves and within the planet at large. Even as we make these prophecies, we do see that the relative severity of this economic collapse into rubble is still dependent upon how much needs to happen before the massive changes at the top level begin to occur. If those at the upper levels of this social structure begin to halt their negatively oriented activities at an earlier point in this game, then it will not need to go as far as it otherwise would. Let's go back to the last one again. So this is very, very intense. And I believe now that Michael is speaking directly to the Alliance, the U.S. military, everybody here. What they're saying is, you don't need to let this go on. You don't need to let this turn into a really, really bad economic collapse. We get to decide when we're going to do the heroic stuff and how bad this needs to be in order to create massive changes at the top level. So I think they're giving notes to the Alliance right now saying, you know, you don't really need to let the economy go totally, totally down the crapper to make the point. And they're going to protect us as this goes along. So Archangel Michael is guiding the entire process, right? 
just like he's making sure we don't have a nuclear war, just like he's making sure tanks can't work when they shouldn't, or planes can't work when they shouldn't, or missiles can't work when they shouldn't, or somebody can't plant bombs because there's this invisible barrier that he can't get through. They're going to be doing tons of this stuff and are doing tons of this stuff right now. But we still have to decide when to stop the economic collapse and, and create massive changes at the top level. And I don't think that, back to the slide, those at the other levels of the social structure begin to halt their negatively oriented activities at an earlier point in this game, it will not need to go as far as it otherwise would. Now, a lot of people have said nasty things about him. I get it, okay, but if, if you take it for what it's worth, Benjamin Fulford, the former uh, East-West bureau chief for Forbes magazine, he was the guy who's been reporting on this alliance stuff since 2006. He's had a lot of insiders who I definitely would strongly disagree with and think are negatively oriented and they're trying to mess with our heads. But he talks to lots and lots of insiders and he puts it out every week on his website, benjaminfulford.net. It is a subscription. You have to pay for it to read it, but I do. And uh, in his last thing from last week, he said that the cabal is now negotiating a surrender. They are suing for peace. They are asking to surrender. Well, Honestly, if I was them and I saw this stuff coming from an archangelic level consciousness, which is much higher than their allies can go in vibration, there is no way they're going to succeed. There is no way that they can pull this off. The whole thing is a setup. And it's good for them to understand that they were set up so that they can surrender earlier because it doesn't really make a difference whether they surrender now or later. They are not going to win. Their only way that something like this on a Sybil of Cume level of intensity, the only way something like this could have happened is because it's true. It's true that they are going to lose. It's true that they cannot win. It's true that there are archangelic forces that will make it absolutely impossible for them to win. They want to get La Palma Volcano to blow up and create a tsunami that wipes out the East Coast. That's not going to work. They want to create a nuclear explosion. That's not going to work. They want to create a massive, massive destruction of our ability to live and have food. That's not going to work. They want to line up everybody and get them all in the camps. That's not going to work. They already said that in the time loop, right? We are not talking about camps and the like that will be formed. It's not going to happen. So again, I've always said this too. Like, look, I'm, I'm actually happy to be a voice of positive change to forgive many people in the deep state. Even people that have done things where we normally would say, well, they have to go to prison. You have to understand that the way that people turn into perpetrators is not that they were born that way, it's that they were traumatized into it. Childhood trauma creates perpetration. The people who are perpetrating against us on earth are really only doing so because they grew up in a cult where they've been persecuted ever since they were born. Tortured, humiliated, ridiculed, disrespected, violently abused, violently attacked. They've had to go through stuff that none of us could even imagine. And they grew up in this very, very intense culture. So it's very sad that people suffer at all. It's very sad that there's an evil group that would want to do this to their own members, but it does exist. But why do we have to destroy the whole planet? You know, in other words, I think a lot of people in the group don't really agree with what's going on right now, and they would love to do something about it. So... If they sue for peace, if they surrender earlier, I will, I've always said this, folks, and I'm not kidding. I'll be on the front lines. In fact, let me, let me get into the, the really close shot here so I can say this to everybody in the cabal, right? Just this one, number five. If you come forward and you're, you're a satanic, you know, pedo or whatever, even at that level, we're all going to have to deal with the fact that disgusting crimes like this, in some cases, will have to be at least partially forgiven. Now, why do I say that? Because in every era, who are the heroes? Heroes are people who arise from within a negative structure and then decide that the negativity needs to stop. So they come from within the structure and then they transform the structure. That's essentially what a hero is. There's many, many historical precedents of people that were involved in a very, very evil group go all throughout time and space who then have an attack of conscience and realize, you know what, I just don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be involved in this anymore. And so if you have a situation where every single person in this group has common criminality, they've all been guided into really dark and ugly behaviors, 
maybe you can arrest all of them, but maybe not. If, if some people have a dark and horrible past and then they come forward for redemption and they want to do the right thing and they contribute in a valuable way to the rapid healing of our earth, I will be the first one in line to tell you to forgive these people. Now, granted, if they've committed crimes, they're probably still going to need to do some kind of prison term, as would happen if you had committed crimes of this nature. But, you know, there may even be... I, there's probably going to be a bunch of people on the spectrum. There's going to be people who have done sexual violence and people who have not, right? There's going to be a lot of people who have participated in this but didn't do those other things because, again, it's only in certain levels of this organization where they're doing this really nasty sexual stuff. Other levels are not doing this, but they still participate and cooperate. So most of the people who are helping them out are actually not sexual violators. And we cannot assume that everyone who's helped them out should all have the same fate. We do need to have amnesty. We do need to have forgiveness. And I've said this over and over again. So back to the slide. If those at the upper levels of the social structure begin to halt their negatively oriented activities at an earlier point, it will not need to go as far as it otherwise would. They might get to stay alive too, right? If you guys actually surrender, then we don't have to send in the U.S. and other militaries. There's, I guess, 30 countries in this alliance from what I just got in the briefing. We don't have to send everybody in to blow the hell out of you guys, but that's what they're about to do. Switzerland may not even exist, <laughs> okay? I remember I was saying last week, well, Switzerland has a great air force, so they can't be invaded. Well, pff, Switzerland's going to get invaded, okay? Because that's where a, a major, major amount of the deep state is. Many of these people probably won't live through the arrest because in order to be arrested, they have to be, you have to get in. And the process of getting in may, you know, end everything. I don't know. I don't want that to happen, but I really think that, you know, surrender is, 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 is better than having people bust in your doors and shoot you, okay? And I think that's the level that we're at right now. So they say, don't break your neck in anticipating that your life is going to be one of terror and lack of fulfillment. I think they're speaking about whistleblowers too. You know, like if you come forward and help us, you'll be given something back really, really well. So instead, look around you and realize the benefits that come with the knowledge that your planet is very naturally moving into a higher dimensional frequency. So we're not going to have terror and lack of fulfillment. Keep in mind the fact that even though you can see other planets around you, it is indeed a multidimensional universe. It is quite natural for different planets to move into and out of certain levels of vibration in accordance with their relative positioning to the solar body or star at the center of their particular system and this relative positioning of the solar system, the galactic center. Well, they were telling me this back in 1999, but I didn't really do the science until later. But if you've read my books and you've seen my videos, then you know that this is a basic aspect of what I've seen and been able to demonstrate scientifically that, in fact, our solar system moves through different regions. You could think of those regions as having a different consciousness, just like astrology. And so now we're moving into this higher consciousness that forces all the negativity on Earth to be blasted out into the open and exposed. As you continue to explore these issues, be reminded of the fact that the wire grommets on your shoes are indeed able to hold the weight of the shoelace as you prepare to walk in the pathways of the divine. They love metaphors, right? You need never fear about the urn being a bloodbath. Instead, this offering that is being given you is the holy water that both purifies yourself and acts as the birdbath for that part of you that will sprout your angel wings and alight into the heavens. So instead of a bloodbath, it's a birdbath. Well, sure enough, uh, time loop again. I've just had a few birds show up in the last two or three days, and they're, they're very hungry, and they want lots of food, so I'm throwing out all the seed for them. And we actually have put out a birdbath for them before. Uh, I probably need to do that again, because I think that's what they're telling me. But when it says you need never fear about the urn being a bloodbath, what they're talking about, the urn, is like where you, you, you do a baptism, right? So the world is being baptized right now. It is, not a bap, it is not a bloodbath. It is a baptism. That's what they're saying. I had one repetition. I tried really hard not to have those this time. So don't fret and fume about the inconsistencies that may arise in your life pattern as all this crazy stuff is going on. That's an understatement, right? It's a lot more than an inconsistency. It's life and death, but they like to joke. 
Don't feel bowled over by the massiveness of such an event, thinking that it will only lead to your suffering. They're talking about what's happening now. Recognize that the vibrations on your particular planet in the solar system are quite naturally moving into a higher dimension of frequency. Although this is very common in the universe, it is a major and epic event in your own neck of the woods. We have done this many times before, in other words, steering an inhabited planet through this transformation, and we will do it many times again. But in this particular case, we are investing a far greater deal of energy than even would normally be done. So they're making absolutely sure nothing bad is going to happen. Our efforts are indeed being well met. Many of the wanderers or alleged extraterrestrial souls, of which I identify as a wanderer, right? Let's just stop and say that for one second. So the whole premise of why I got into the Law of One in the first place was reading a book in 1995 by Dr. Scott Mandelker called From Elsewhere, which was a book on, let's, let's go over here again. The, the book From Elsewhere was talking about the idea of people having a soul that is angelic or extraterrestrial. And what he says is that you're never going to fit in. You're never going to understand why people are evil, why they betray you. You'll be horrified by negativity. You're very naive. You're easily easy to take advantage of. You daydream about fantasy, extraterrestrials, UFOs. You feel that you had powers that you've since lost. You feel that there's no point in meditating because you've lost your powers that meditation would have provided you. There's all kind of very specific things. You feel like your parents are not really your parents, that your real parents must be somewhere else. And so Mandelker's book had this list of questions. And if you can answer these things about yourself, you must be an ET soul. Well, in my case, like all 12 of them were amazingly descriptive of me, even more than maybe my own parents would have known, because this was getting into stuff that you don't normally tell your parents, but you might tell your therapist. And Mandelker worked as a therapist. So I was really, really blown away when I found this book. And then if you read Awakening in the Dream, I got automatic writing coming through when I asked, am I in fact an ET soul? And they got very, very granular where I just got a few characters, EC, 40, 57, and Oxen. It was this weird encoded quote. But it ended up quoting the Bible, and then it says, Christ cometh, and it says, uh, it quotes out of the book of Ecclesiastes, 2.22 to 3.13, which was 40 to 57 verses after the beginning. They gave the absolute number of verses, EC, Ecclesiastes, 40, 57. 2.22 to 3.13 Ecclesiastes remarkably described the fact that I had just lost my job right before I got the automatic writing. Because the first thing it says is, for what hath a man toiled and labored under the sun, this too is meaningless. So I was so worried about losing this job that I had just lost because I was working at a mental hospital thinking that I was going to get internship credit for a PhD in psychology, which I wanted to have, to be a UFO researcher so people would take me seriously. And I never ended up finishing the degree. I, I ha I've had honorary doctorates offered to me. Hopefully I'll take one of them as time goes on, but I've just been too busy to do the work. Um, it's not that much. I mean, you know, my, my first and second half of source field investigations alone is more than enough for doctoral dissertation, as I've been told. Just the first half. Typical dissertation is 150 references. The first book has like a thousand, okay? So I've been offered honorary diplomas and all this kind of stuff. Um, but again, you know, what the hell good is a PhD if I haven't built a hover car? The hover car is much more exciting to me than a doctorate. Uh, so anyway, when the Wanderer thing came up, I got it through this weird automatic writing that very much seemed to know that I had just lost my job. And then afterwards is when it, a year later, turned into the telepathic contact, uh, the fruits of which you're reading now. So... What they say in the Law of One is that they're, at the Law of One's time, it was like 60 million, 65 million people. Now we estimate it's about 300 million people who are angelic beings, who are here as humans, but they forgot that they're angelic beings. And that's part of the mission. You don't get to remember that you're an angelic being unless you do a lot of spiritual work and a lot of meditation and a lot of trauma healing. It's the only way. That's why... When Michael has me out there touching the aspen trees in the forest, I have to cry. I cannot take the forest's healing without an emotional cleansing first. You need to let go of the stuff before the healing can even work. So I'll be out there touching two trees and opening the sphere out into the forest and then inhale the forest. The next thing you know, you just start bawling. 
Yeah, it, it, if you don't believe me, just try it, okay? If you get enough meditation, it'll work. So we have all these people who are ET souls who are part of these greater uh, forces in the universe that are helping us on Earth, and they don't consciously remember what they're here for, but they have everything to do with why this is working out. And I believe all the top names in the Alliance are obviously angelic souls. You know, that goes without saying. So the Mikes and everybody else I mentioned before, if you get down deep, you're going to find out this is who you are, in my opinion. So many of the wanderers who have come into physical existence upon your plane have indeed satisfied their missions. And I believe we're seeing a lot of this now, you know, all the big names I was just talking about and others. They have satisfied their missions at this time, and they are bringing about the change in society they had always hoped for. It has always been our desires to increase the numbers of for harvest as much as possible. And this is just the way they said it. So, you know, I didn't get the word desire right. I got the S on the end. We can continue to do this, and it does not really matter in the end whether large numbers of people are reading these readings or not. The greater work is being done in the minds and hearts of each and every individual, both through the work of the wanderers in the physical, as well as those working on the outside, so to speak. So when we really look at the big picture, you will see this is a massive team effort in place. If you are a wanderer yourself, or certainly have musings about same, we want to thank you and remind you that any time you take up the reins and begin to be of service to others, you are activating your own potentials in ways you could never have heretofore imagined. Anyone who helps us to usurp the negative vibrations on this planet is a hero or a heroine in their own right and deserves our praise. And I hope you really can hear that. I mean, the beings do really love it when you step up as a hero. There's nothing greater you could do with your life than to convert your life into a heroic cause. Because the hero's journey is the galactic plan. It's the Christ metaphor, right? The hero's journey was completed by Jesus going through the crucifixion, the resurrection. But that's a metaphor of our lives on earth and how we all must live. And what we all go through, we all have to become a hero. We all have to face the impossible. We all have to take on the quest that seems totally lethal and, and then do it anyway. That's, that's what this is about. So, so many of you right now are having to leave the comfort of the security of the job that you might have had. I grew up in a family where my mother was gigging. And so I grew up with never knowing if my mother was going to lose her job. And she'd start crying and I'd tell her, don't worry, mom, we, you always get another job. It's going to be fine. I was the counselor when I was like seven, eight, nine years old, this started to happen. So, and I was always right. I told her, mom, it's going to be fine. You know, you always find something. You always find another job. And sure enough, she did. So this kind of like solo freelancer work is where everybody needs to go now. If, if you think that the only way you can earn money is to work for a corporation, find out what you're most passionate about. Do you want to make engraved cowboy boots? Do you like to make harmonicas? Do you want to, I don't know what the hell it is. I mean, maybe you're an artist. There's ways to do things that you can sell to other people and make money. And so everybody now is being asked by the circumstances to have that kind of flexibility. And again, they said anyone who helped, back to the slide, anyone who helps us usurp negative vibrations on earth is a hero in their own right and deserves our praise. And their praise is very good to have, by the way, because they can do a lot of good miracles for you to keep you moving forward in, in this life on earth, my life being proof of this. The wanderers have an especially difficult mission, having left behind their natural realms of vibration to incarnate into a physical body on the earth and take upon the karmic responsibility of service to others in this vibrational frequency. This is an extraordinarily difficult path and a variety of traumas can occur that make the sojourn on earth quite difficult. We touched on some of these in the dream, which again, I didn't read, but it's, it's you know, not that important. And so the point to remember is that you are not looking at the back end of the mouse. <laughs> what? This is the kind of symbolic stuff they say, right? The point to remember is you are not looking at the back end of the mouse and seeing how its tail has turned into a rat. You are rather looking at the front end at the face and realizing its cuteness, such that it could be designed and put into many different greeting cards and the like. So this is a metaphor saying that it's actually a cute mouse and not a horrible rat. What's going on in the world right now? It is this small mouse within yourself that will sneak around the gigantic structures in place and be able to find enough food to keep your family alive. This is not in the least bit terrifying. <laughs> but what they're saying is, yes, we all have this. We all have this small mouse within ourselves 
everybody's going to climb around the corporate structure and figure out a way to keep society going. So we're not going to be starving. It is this mouse within yourself that is also capable of moving around the guardians at the gate in order to pass into the temple of the beyond. This is a specific metaphorical reference to the afterlife. So this, this humble mouse within us, when we meditate, we can actually peer into the afterlife and gain information. We appreciate and applaud all of your efforts to continue to not be ballyhooed by the extreme circumstances that are necessarily unfolding. We remind you that your services are being accepted with open arms in the higher realms and that this cosmic lens does continue to focus. Many of those who have never read these readings are aware that a conspiracy of events seems to be occurring whose purpose is ultimately very metaphysical. It is unfortunate that many will feel that sense of suspenseful violence, not knowing the reality of what is occurring and the positivity therein. All we can say is that each one of you who reads these words can do your own part in your own area to spread the word at this point about what is subsequently going to occur and the reality of ascension as such. All of this is part of the plan. They even referenced the plan. Wow. How did they know about the plan in 99? Well, because they were probably helping design it. We have enunciated these details before they have come to pass in order that you be better able to deal with and accept them at the appropriate time, right? So they're telling you, don't worry about it. We're predicting the future so that you don't freak out. We will soon be shifting the nature of these readings, workings as they call it here, away from explicating so much on these changes you are about to go through and more into the study of compassion itself and how it relates to you as an individual. It is this more timeless material that will allow us to put the finishing touches on the work we have brought through David. We thank you and we remind you you are loved more than you could ever possibly imagine. Peace be with you in the light of everlasting love. We now end this reading, Adonai. And then last but not least, this I had to include this at the last minute. I said, no, it's going in. Just a couple more little ones from the 13th. And there might be one on the 15th, but they're very small. So check this out. Wednesday, October 13th, I have this dream where it says somewhere in the middle of this, there was the idea that Sabrina might go to Arizona instead of Florida for the winter. And then in the next paragraph, seeing the new construction at Jay's was quite incredible. And I guess the construction represents my own work in a sense and how it is expanding. So first of all, Sabrina might go to Arizona for the winter. Well, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm about to go back to Arizona for the winter. So, whoa. How did it show up in this dream? Well, again, it's the time loop. And then seeing the new construction at Jay's was quite incredible. And so in this dream, there were vast, vast airport type military facilities being built as well as very significant underground bases. They were huge and it was all leading to the creation of like hover cars and anti-gravity. So the, the new construction in the dream is literally talking about Right now, we have buildings that we're renovating to do this anti-gravity-free energy. So once again, an incredible time loop. And so there it is. Seeing the new construction at Jay's was quite incredible. All this very time loop. How did they know I was going to go to Arizona for the winter back in 99? I, didn't, I had no idea I'd ever live in Arizona. Now look at this. The very next line. Defeating even the scariest men and women who apply for the role of vice president is our goal. <laughs> this is nuts. This is crazy. Defeating even the scariest men and women who apply for the role of vice president is our goal. The guy who's president right now used to be vice president and the scariest men and women. And who's the vice president? A woman. Men and women who apply for the role of vice president. The first female vice president is the scariest, right? How the hell did they do this? It's so obvious what's going on. So obvious. Back to the slide. We want you to likewise expand even further than you have heretofore imagined by living this existence that you call divine and experiencing its creation at the immediate physical level. So then we have one last fragment from October 15, 1999. In this case, again, I decide to take a picture of it because it's just really, really strange. At the exact second that I said that, the words Loma Prieta earthquake popped into my mind off to the side, right? And we've been talking about this La Palma volcano 
which if they if they get this volcano to blow up enough and again you see these weird hot spots right so it's being zapped by microwave beams which is very easy to do with satellites and heat things up and everybody's got a microwave so you, you know how that works well they're hoping the, the bad guys are hoping that this volcano is going to collapse into the ocean create a, a tsunami that just wipes out the east coast of the united states and they've been really really trying on this so this is a big deal right now because they're zapping the thing right now and it's erupting right now so this is a time time loop okay we already saw them say mount pinatubo is is getting ready to burst again and that whole thing was obviously talking about it and then here once again they they didn't say las palmas or la palma they said loma prieta so it's very close l-o-m-a is l-a take out the o and m you got la prieta palma it starts with a p and it ends with an a so they're very very similar and then right after they're saying this and we know now what these overlords are trying to do with the la palma earthquake and volcano they say over the side the overlords will go so in other words Instead of, them try, instead of the overlords sending the volcano's material over the side, they are the ones who are going to go over the side into the water, into the ocean, right? Metaphorically. When we speak of an immediate sense, we mean to indicate that the planetary changes will continue to do their disorder as time progresses. The active stage of this process is already in effect now. The passive stage does not come until things have quietened back down somewhat drastically. The more active you become the better able you will be to then navigate through these changes. And I, I really do think that in terms of saying more active, more physical activity means you're going to be healthier as you navigate through these changes. So they're talking very literally about exercise. So again, Loma, back to the slide, Loma Prieta, earthquake, and then over the side, the overlords will go. And here's La Palma, Loma Prieta, La Palma, very similar, erupting right now in the time loop with these weird hot spots that clearly show possible evidence of microwaves now this is the last one i've got for you okay it's very very weird rupati just attacked a bowling ball a thousand years ago rupati attacked a bowling ball hmm this process employs opportunities whenever possible keep all eyes and ears open for future guidance on these matters the satellites will indeed have their way with you through resonance <laughs> satellite resonance and wouldn't it be that you could think of you could actually let's go to the tight one here wouldn't it be in, this this five yeah wouldn't it be interesting if this if this volcano you know the analogy that the that the forces could make is that the volcano could be like a bowling ball right because the idea is it drops into the water and then this tsunami comes and hits the side of, of, of the East Coast, right? So it's like the bowling ball hitting the bowling pins, right? Now, they couldn't actually say the word Trump in the time loop. It would get too close. It would get too obvious. But Rupati has almost all the letters of the, of the name Trump in it. Almost in, you know, R-U-P. We'll, we'll show this in just a second. So I think Rupati actually means Trump. And I think that it's talking about the alliance, he just attacked a bowling ball. That's the bowling ball of La Palma, right, that they were just talking about when they called it Loma Prieta, and over the side the overlords will go. They're trying to set off this volcano so that it hits, so that a tsunami hits the East Coast like the idea of a bowling ball hitting bowling pins. So Rupati just attacked a bowling ball, which probably means the alliance right now, with his help, is stopping this from happening. And then it says a thousand years ago, Rupati attacked a bowling ball, meaning it's like time loops. The same, we keep doing the same jobs again and again. The satellites will indeed have their way with you through resonance. That's what they're trying to do. That's how they're trying to create this and probably means a lot of other things. You don't want to be a freshman about this, but rather understand very directly what is going on. So then, as I said, you can take Rupati. And, and they, they've already encoded Trump before with interim period. T-E-R-I-M-P is Trump. Very close. Same letter, same order. But then here you can see that actually there's, there's a lot of, of alphanumeric similarity between these names. And so this is what they have to do to slip it under my conscious mind. And actually, believe it or not, I was scrambling before we taped 
to find a dream that I had somewhere in like 95 that Donald Trump was the president of the United States. And it's in one of my notebooks and I've been looking for it. And you guys saw me, right? I spent almost an hour looking for this thing before we tape today just to try to show you the dream. I don't have it yet, but I will find it for next week. I think I will. So again, the last thing that I want to share with you guys is that the future is indeed in free energy and anti-gravity. And so this is why now is the time to sign up at thedisclosure.com. So let's go over to this camera again because I love this one. So when you go to thedisclosure.com, you're actually directly participating. You're going to get the ebook that I'm going to dictate it as an audio book of all the Michael prophecies, including the stuff that's outside the scope of what I can unseal each week because these are vast. There's much more of them. So I will eventually get all of them out to the public, but I'm going to cram them all together in the audio book. So even if it's, again, four hours long, whatever, I don't care. However long it is, I'm going to get you all the Michael as fast as I can so that if there's other stuff that's very time sensitive, even though I'm eventually going to say it in the video, if you get the Michael prophecies, you're going to hear it right away. In fact, let's uh, I'll pull that, that book up once again here just so we can have that to cut to. Let's see. Boy, I say a lot of stuff, don't I? There's a tremendous, tremendous number of slides. <laughs> My God. Okay, here we go. And we're still going. Yeah, it's, it's amazing all the stuff that I crank out. It really is. I mean, I don't know how I do it, but I just am very dedicated. So, all right, hold on. Boy, I got lost. Okay, there we go. There it is. Okay, so uh, you can you can cut back to that occasionally if you want to. But um, so this this was the, the the cover of the book. It was shown to me. Uh, does, as I said, it didn't look exactly the same as the way Michael wanted to see it, but he doesn't care, you know. So this is probably going to become a published book too, uh, and I might expand it when I go into the next published version. But in the meantime. I'm rushing it out. All the Michael stuff, any unsealed time loop data that I can find, it's all going in in text and in audio. And I expect that that part alone is going to be totally worth the price of admission because it's so amazing. And again, when you listen to these words, you're acclimating yourself to the higher consciousness. My wife and I are going to be doing an expanding awareness meditation and again, in week six, I have been given some exercises already that really seem to be the precursors to levitation, if you can believe that. Um, I'll go into detail on the exercises I've already shared and others that I haven't shared. And I'm going to be talking about the Tibetan Lungampa, uh, the, the guys that levitated in Tibet. I'm going to be talking about Christian saints, Catholic saints. I'm going to be talking about Tibetans and how they levitated and the, and the anecdotal reports of what these people said happened to them when they levitated and how it felt. So uh, I didn't want to go much beyond four hours, which means we are dead out of time. But again, before I do that, um, please go to thedisclosure.com and actually sign up and buy this class because you stepping forward and doing this for us allows us to help you make hover cars and get them out there into the public. So this is urgently needed. And with all the Michael stuff that's going on around the timing of this launch, it's just fascinating. So getting to see a new insider is going to be very, very amazing. Ben is very articulate. And again, when you come out of this thing, you're going to know how free energy works and anti-gravity. And then when we go into week six, I'm going to go through that Gravenikov stuff again. We're going to talk about how I think the insect wings are creating anti-gravity. And I'm going to compare it with all the stuff that Ben has told us. And we're going to talk about plants and why do all plants have the sap levitate through the middle of the trunk? You know, and what is that? Maybe that's anti-gravity, right? Just like the tornado levitation. So it's, it's, a, it's going to be a very exciting time. It looks great. It sounds great. We got tons and tons of beautiful motion graphics and slides. And I hope you don't miss The Disclosure. So please go to thedisclosure.com. Uh, there is a VIP package available if you wanted to sign up for that where you actually also get to be a part of a live stream where Ben and I will be talking about this directly. Uh, that allows people to contribute more if they want to. You don't have to buy the VIP package. 
Uh, and we are getting ready to do a payment plan. We haven't started just yet. So if you're like, oh my God, is David ever going to do a payment plan? Yes, we are. We're getting all that worked out with our system. So that will be coming up in the future. Uh, hopefully you can do it now, you know, because our financial need is now, I can tell you that. Anyway, without further ado, uh, let's go into the meditation so I don't exceed four hours, okay? Because that's the, once it's got four hours on it, there's nothing I can do about it. All right, so here we go. I'll go into the, uh, the wide shot. I'd like you to place both feet flat upon the floor. And just let yourself relax. Allow yourself to breathe in. And just let it go. And as you continue nourishing yourself with this healing oxygen, we again send our healing energy to the La Palma volcanic mountain in the Canary Islands, or what they call Loma Prieta. All the tension leaving, no need for massive earth changes. Truly getting into a deep peace, knowing that as scary as everything in the world seems right now, that there are higher forces in the universe. Of course there are. We're not the only game. And we're not the highest game in town either. Higher forces steering us through this global transformation, making sure that we have enough food, making sure that we will always be taken care of, that everything will be okay. And we ask again that you look within and see those issues that caused you pain. Look, if you will, at the faces of those who hurt you the most in your life. And if you so desire, and if you feel ready for this, as you look at each of their faces, tell them that you love them, and tell them that you understand, and tell them that they are forgiven. And even if you're not ready to do this with all of those faces just yet, you can rest solid in the knowing that this is the path. We are so grateful to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for our guidance through this. And we are grateful for the knowledge, according to the law of one, that this isn't just some secondhand player who came and went on earth, as the deep state might like to believe. This is the embodiment of the consciousness of the galaxy. And with helpers that were described in the Bible, like Archangel Michael, these are real beings. They are proving that to us. They are showing us that they exist. They are showing us that we are going to be okay. And thus, in this moment, we affirm our guidance. We affirm our protection. We affirm the trust in the goodness and the safety of this universe and that all things that we see on earth right now are actually being benevolently steered by very powerful angelic beings to a true ascension type of event for all those on earth, a world with hover cars, free energy, anti-gravity, de-radiating and getting rid of all the garbage. This is our future and we are co-creating it together. And we are taking this one step at a time. And so it is. All right, let's now breathe our way back into the room. Wiggle your fingers, wiggle your toes. And I hope that your next destination is right here on this slide. Go to thedisclosure.com. You can cut to the slide, yeah. <laughs> That's what you're going to see when you go there. And remember, cut to the slide, please. <laughs> I just got to tell Lulu like three times. Well, you've been working for four hours. It's okay. I, let, I forgive you. I got to practice what I just was teaching. So this is what you're going to see when you go to the website. And again, there's a really, really cool video there. It's longer than you think, and it's very amazing. So please go to thedisclosure.com, watch the video. I'm David Wilcock, and we will see you next time. Thanks for watching.